Order and welcome to the Scottish Affairs Committee and today we have a trio of former Secretaries of State for Scotland who I will now allow to introduce themselves. Um, which perhaps tell just our, our viewers and listeners, and we know there's always many listening into the Scottish Affairs Committee, which period you serve as Secretary, that would be helpful, and anything by way of a short introductory statement. And we'll start with you, Baroness Little. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Chairman. I, uh, I'm uh, the Right Honourable Baroness Little of Cote Dyke, but otherwise known as Helen Little, certainly when I was Secretary of State. Uh, between 2001 and 2003, and that was right at the very beginning. And uh, a lot of people were quite nervous, uh, particularly uh, members of parliament and civil service, about getting things wrong, uh, because we'd never been in this kind of situation before with a devolved uh, assembly. And it was quite, uh, it, it was quite a challenging time. But it did mean that there were, because we knew each other, you know, I knew everybody who was, uh, who was in the cabinet with me and had known them for many years. I, I was, what, 11 years as general secretary of the party in Scotland. And then uh, as a consequence, I would do national conference and things like that. So I tended to know everybody. And uh, I have to confess that an awful lot of the difficulties that we experienced got resolved in the tea room because you know we could sit down and talk and discuss what what would be the right thing to do what would be a problematic thing to do and as a consequence move forward excellent and thank you ever so much for that and it's just mr alexander no title for your good self yet but uh, please thank you mr chairman um, members of the committee uh, my name is douglas alexander i served as secretary of state for scotland from the 6th of May 2006 until the 28th of June 2007. Given that this period in the Scotland office is now some time ago, and the fact that over the last eight years I've been pursuing other interests as a private citizen, it is only since I received your generous invitation to appear as a witness before this committee that I've had reason to recollect in any detail the operation of devolution and intergovernmental relations during my period of office. <laughs> In that regard, I'd like to extend my gratitude publicly to Chloe Smith, the committee clerk, for her consideration and professionalism yeah, yeah, um, with yeah. which she offered suggestions as to how best to prepare for today's discussion. I welcome the opportunity to endeavour to answer the committee's questions alongside my former colleagues Baroness Little and Lord Brown and have, in preparation for that discussion, read the relevant sections of Hansard, the evidence given to the committee by previous witnesses and considered the constitution unit at UCL's devolution monitoring programme, which was itself very helpful from the time to refresh my memories. This work, in anticipation of today's hearing, has reinforced my initial recollection that during my period in office, as you've heard from other witnesses, I have no recollection of intergovernmental relations being a significant problem, and in fact, they were characterised by a high degree of collaboration and cooperation. Thank you for that. And lastly, Lord Brown. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, so I'm Des Brown, and because there is more than one Lord Brown in the, in the House of Lords, in fact, there's a number of Lord Browns with an E at the end of their name, so I'm Lord Brown of Ladyton. Um, so I was the Secretary of State for uh, Scotland, and I'll get this out of the way at the beginning, the Secretary of State for Defence um, from the 28th of June, 2007 until there's the second page of this um, until the 3rd of October 2008 uh, when uh, Jim Murphy took over following a reshuffle when I retired from government anyway so um, so I, I, I first of all you know I echo the words that Douglas used about the assistance that we were given from your staff and Chloe in particular. I don't pick her, I pick her out because I remember her name, but all the staff that we were involved with I think were very helpful and there were difficulties about scheduling and disruption and things like that, so which made it easier then. And certainly you know, the indication of the things that, that you were interested in was a good help in terms of preparation because to be honest when I got this invitation at first I thought I don't really remember very much about this, it was quite a while ago. Um, and. Uh, I, I, so, and, and I, I, you know, I, I include in that thanks the staff of the uh, Scotland Office who helped us, you know, find in the public record and open record, which I'll draw in quite extensively, um, in answer to your questions, the uh, the information that showed 
um, what the, you know, my experience was. I can just say, you know, I, I don't recollect any problems at all. Um, and, and in fact, I do. I, I have uncovered from uh, from Hansard the. Uh, I think probably the first question I answered in Scottish uh, questions, which uh, interestingly enough, Pete, you asked me. Me. Oh, right. and, wow. and 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 considering you know what you're doing here, it was when I next expected the plenary joint ministerial committee to meet. <laughs> So I give you a very, f I thought, a very full and helpful answer. I said that the government were aware of calls for a meeting of the Joint Ministerial Committee and we were considering this proposal. That's a very fulsome <laughs> response, as would, one would expect, well, it's, uh, it's from the esteemed of, former Secretary of State. Um, so, uh, but it's the next uh, intervention that I want to draw to your attention. The first two sentences of your response were, one, I think, had a hint of irony about it. May I thank the Secretary of State for that helpful response? <laughs> But the second one I treasure, and bear in mind I'm in this job for about 10 days, may I also commend him for the constructive and positive way in which he is engaged with the Scottish Government. If it's OK with you, I'll just leave now. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, 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 so, so just uh, without going into a lot of detail about this, I just want to, um, I just want to remind you, as you, you know, that there was, in fact, during my term of office, a meeting of the Joint uh, plenary uh, um, ministerial committee, uh, and that took place in June of the next year. So, just just to complete this bookend um, and to help you to understand just how good relations were, the uh, sorry, I, sh I should also have said that I took office um, I exa I almost exactly a month over Alex Salmond became a first minister. Um, so. The uh, Joint Ministerial Committee's joint statement after that meeting contains one sentence which I think you'll be really interested in. It is in the in the third the second yeah the third full paragraph of the second page of this, and it reads as follows: uh, The meeting also took stock of the state of relations between the administrations represented. But this is the real important question. They noted there was a great deal of daily contact at all levels. Very helpful and fulsome responses. And thank you for those recollections, uh, Lord Brown. Uh, very helpful to this committee. I mean, what we're, I think we're trying to capture in the course of this inquiry is just the changing nature of devolution. And I think we could sort of categorize it as three periods, the, the early years where there was the same government and of all, um, all places of government in, in the United Kingdom, then the years between 2007, possibly right up to the referendum, where you know, like there's different government in Scotland and there was obvious issues and tensions that emerged from that, and then the, the post um, referendum period leading up to Brexit. And I think these are the sort of three periods that we seem to be. Um, dealing with in terms of our conversations with many of our witnesses here. You guys were all there at the very early stages, the, the cosy, comfortable relationships, if we want to categorise it as such. And of course, um, as you said, Des, that you were there in that transition and Douglas was there in the first year or so of a SNP Scottish Government. Maybe I'll come to you first then, um, Baroness, I don't know if that's all right. I mean, did it feel as cosy and comfortable as you're sort of suggesting? Was it all just around a cup of tea in the tea room where all the outstanding issues and difficulties, because I'd imagine there would be some difficulties and challenges at, at that period, even though you were all relatively familiar with each other, possibly even friends. But there must have been some points where you would disagree with colleagues in Scotland and possibly have to have, a, I don't know, a, an extended conversation about some of these issues. That usually happened on a Friday night because the, the downside was that we had everybody's telephone numbers. So I would get home on a Friday night and I'd usually get a phone call from somebody. But it was mostly about definition because uh, people didn't fully understand where uh, the UK government began and ended and the Scottish government would begin and end. And I, I think people were genuine, and this includes civil servants, not, not just ministers. People were a bit unsure about how everything was going to play out. And you, can, you could understand why that was the case. And sometimes, uh, you know, somebody would say, oh, oh, well, you can't do that. And I would have to say, but actually, we can, because it's actually in the legislation. So it was getting that transition from uh, being frightened and nervous about things to actually settling down and looking at issues in, in some detail. 
And uh, I, I mentioned a lot of the, the, the in, in, in 2019, I think, when I last gave evidence to this committee about the fact that we spent an awful lot of time in uh, cabinet committees. There were 19 cabinet committees and there was only myself and initially uh, Lord Fowkes of Cumnock, who has joined us in the audience today. But uh, it was very difficult getting round all of these, and I occasionally had to ask the Advocate General to, to go and you know, just take some notes and tell me what was going on. We managed to get that sorted out because an awful lot of it was unnecessary. But the, the problem was just finding the way forward that meant that both sides of the debate could be taken into account and that colleagues who were not used to having to take things into account for, for Scotland would understand what the nuts and bolts of the devolution legislation was like. Do you think um, we should have done more, or perhaps yourself as, as, a, as a Secretary of State at that point, to prepare for what were almost inevitably further difficulties down the road when there would be different governments? Or was it just assumed that this was always going to be the way things would work and transpire. I mean, did we miss an opportunity to really set in place a proper infrastructure and machinery of intergovernment relations at that point when it was where it was generally quiet? Well, I, th I think to some extent it's because we were all Scots. We had lived with the whole devolution debate for many, many years, and a lot of people were just beginning to catch up with it and the extent to which it would affect them. And you know, I include civil servants in that as well as ministers. So it was, it, it, you know, it was sort of feel it and see and see how you can, how you can move forward. We eventually got there uh, and some of it was, you know, just having to sit down and explain to somebody how the Scottish devolution situation impacted on what was happening down south. Things like education, it was clearer. Uh, when you got to university education, it was a little bit different. But in other areas, uh, for example, around the economy and so on, people, and we were greatly helped by the fact that the Chancellor of the Exchequer at the time and the, um, the Chief Secretary of the Treasury were both Scots. So they actually knew how the whole process worked. So it was just getting people up to speed. We probably should have spent more time as a government discussing uh, prior to uh, the, the, the Parliament being set up, discussing how the, how the devolution settlement was to work. And that, that was the key part of it. Can I maybe turn to uh, uh, Lord Brown and Mr Alexander then? When, when you came into Secretary of State and you had have observed what was in place, were, were you generally satisfied with what you observed in terms of the, the infrastructure was in place, the relationships that had been built up? Or did you feel there was a need to change anything that you had previously seen? We'll, we'll start with you, Mr Alexander. Let me take it chronologically. Um, uh, firstly, um, Mr Chairman, just a point of clarification. Um, it was under Des's period in office, just a month in, that Alex Hammond was, who I understand is about to give evidence to the committee, became the First Minister. So my period was entirely with, with Jack McConnell as, as First Minister. Um, broadly, no, there was continuity rather than change on my arrival. Um, I don't recollect that I had the honour of answering your question first uh, as uh, Secretary of State, but I did look at the UCL Constitution report for the period. Um, I was Secretary of State from the 6th of May 2006, and they published their half-yearly report on January of 2007, and they stated this, on the formal level, intergovernment, intergovernmental relations remain as low-key as ever. And I think um, almost two decades on, that's a pretty accurate characterisation, that relationships were informal, um, low-key, collaborative. That partly reflected the point that um, Helen has just made, which is we did all know each other, whether that was the principal ministers in the Scottish Government. It helps if your sister and your best man are both members of the government uh, in knowing each other. Um, and in that sense, that's just a small personal example of the fact that literally we had journeyed in Scottish politics together for many years. Critically, the civil service knew each other, and I know that that's been mm -hmm. a point that um, uh, others have recognised and referenced in the evidence that they've given to your committee. I don't think that we should underweight the significance of the official making the phone call on a Friday evening or during the week, being familiar with their opposite number, respectively, either in Westminster or in, or in Holyrood. And that naturally has atrophied over a period of time as people have retired and, and, and times have moved on. So in that sense, I think we all knew each other. 
um, the officials knew each other, mm -hmm. and thirdly, there was broadly a high degree of consensus in terms of the balance of intergovernmental relations and the broad policy directions of challenge uh, or, or policy direction that was set. The one observation that I would make, though, again, in, in preparing for today's session, and uh, this came through the Scottish Devolution Monitoring Report that I referenced that was published in January of 2007. It quotes an answer that was given by Jack McConnell when he was First Minister during my time as Scottish Secretary, and with the committee's forbearance, I'll just read the answer, because um, I think it's illustrative of the approach that was taken in Holyrood at the same time as we were taking an approach in the Scotland office. It said, on the formal level, intergovernmental inter relations remain as low-key as ever. This is me reading the report. There have been no meetings of the plenary joint ministerial committee, nor any publicised meetings of functional formats of the GMC during this period. Some information has crept out through answers to questions in the Scottish Parliament. In response to a question from Ewan Robson, MSP, about joint parliamentary committees, Jack McConnell said, and the date of his answer is in the Scottish Parliament official record on the 16th of November, 2006 at column 29399, Jack said this, although in the early days of devolution, such joint committees operated with some success in a number of policy areas, they were felt to be inappropriate for the Parliament's second term. However, given the commitment of the Parliament and this devolved government to reduce poverty in Scotland to further economic development and to address some major environmental challenges which affect the responsibilities of the governments at Westminster and in Scotland, it might be worth looking at resurrecting them of those joint, or resurrecting those joint committees or indeed other kinds of committees that are more appropriate for today. I'm certainly happy to do so. The question whether a formal joint committee is required is another matter. That leaves the impression, as the report indicated, that the initiative not to use the JMC was not the exclusive province of Whitehall, but actually there was a certain attitude within the Scottish Government that they did not want to appear to be being directed by the UK Government. And in that answer, I think it's a fairly authentic representation at the time that if there wasn't formal meetings that were happening, it was partly because of all the informal work that was happening, but also there was a political dynamic to it as well. You had a Scottish government, finding, or Scottish executive at the time, finding its feet keen to establish its authority, authority over very significant areas of devolved policy. It wouldn't have been, I, I, I follow that entirely, and that's a very good point that you make, but it wouldn't have been useful, particularly for what was to come, that the JMCs and all the joint committees were functioning up and running and were operating regularly. Surely that should have been something that all those that were in responsibility and positions of power should have been considering and putting in place. Respectfully, I think structures have their place, but are of limited utility without the political will to exercise them effectively. And I was very struck by Lord Wallace of Tankerness's observation about attending a committee and looking out the window and being rather bored because there was nothing to talk about. It was an amusing anecdote, but it was very reflective of do we really want to burden very busy ministers in Holyrood or indeed um, down here with the expectation of structured engagement where, frankly, the informal processes and structures are sufficient. So I think, to be fair to that generation of politicians, A, um, government was new and relatively new to the devolved um, administration and to the devolved government. But equally, we had just undertaken a radical and significant constitutional reform on the basis first of the White Paper and then of the Scotland Act. And in that sense, I, I think it, it's a very high bar to expect that back in those early years of the noughties, we could have anticipated the two big inflection points that you've already referenced, whether that is the independence referendum of 2014 or indeed Brexit and the subsequent choices made by the public in 2016. Hey, thank you. And just lastly, Lord Brown, when you assumed office, what, how did you observe the arrangements and relationship in place? And were you satisfied with what you inherited? I mean, I mean, I mean I'm... Uh, I'm interested in cooperative working. I mean, I, I mean that's why I do. And you know, in this, this ter part of my life, I spend all my time trying to get people to talk to each other. Um, so, I, I, I mean, I, I always have a kind of focus on that: how we can work together. And that, but, um, but I'm not. The, the first point is that you know I was also the Secretary of State for Defence, right? And I had an excellent. Minister of State and David Cairns. I mean, he was excellent. I don't think anybody who knew him, he was he was Secretary of State material, you know. And but for 
the terrible tragedy of his death, um, untimely death, he would have become a very good mm -hmm. Secretary of State. So, and I, and I was delighted <laughs> that I had that, you know, backup. And he did, honestly, a lot of the work that I'm sure in, <coughs> other, in other times the Secretary of State had responsibility for. The, the, the other point is that, I mean, I wasn't as close when I was elected in 1997 and then, you know, the Scottish Parliament in 1999. I wasn't as close to that as a backbencher as others who were either very close to um, and, and advising uh, um, uh, secretaries of state and, and above, um, and uh, or, or or Helen was who was had been involved in this before and continued at the level that she was uh, best at throughout. I mean, I, I was a backbencher. I was on the Northern Ireland Select Committee, the Public Administration Select Committee, various other things. And then when I became a minister, I became the Minister for Criminal Justice and Politics in Northern Ireland. So, I mean, if you, I mean, that, 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 that you know, if, if organising, you know, circumstances in which people could work together across barriers, you know, w was just part of my everyday job. But, I, but th then, I mean, I have to say this, I had experience as a Minister of State for a period in the Department for Work and Pensions, I was a Minister for Work. And I'll say this, um, I mean, every day that I was a Minister for Work, there were more uh, people working in Scotland and, and in the rest of the United Kingdom than ever before, every day. Um, and I don't claim credit for that policy. And actually, the policy we inherited from the major government, but we didn't break it. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the was, things were working and, and, and we had to work at that level with other parts of the government and other ministers. And, I mean, that was just part of the way in which we worked. And I, and I'm bound to say that when I became the Secretary of State for Scotland and was preparing for questions from people like you, uh, I, uh, I did my homework. And the, 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 the MOU for the Plenary Joint Ministerial Committee has a sentence in it which <coughs> describes, I think, what I was satisfied was happening, which is that um, the MOU talked about the Joint Ministerial Committee, but it said that most contact, most contact, and this I quote, should be carried out on a bilateral or multilateral basis between departments which deal on a day-to-day -day basis with the issues at stake. And I refer you back to that, you know, that joint statement at the end when there eventually was one, and that's exactly what people said was happening. So, I mean, while I'm really interested in cooperative working, I'm not that keen on meetings for meetings' sake. You know, and, and, and I, I mean, I pedantically will correct Douglas um, because it was the month before I became, not the month after I became the Secretary of State that, that uh, Alex Salmond began. And I had meetings with Alex, calls with him, meetings with him, I remember actually, meeting him at Hamden Park where Scotland beat. Uh, Ukraine 3 1 on one occasion. Spent quite a lot of time, I have to say, at half time out on the balcony uh, on his own with the Scottish football supporters. Just looking well, at maybe we've, I mean, all I could say is all of you were generous as Secretary of State for yeah. meeting with backbenchers yeah. from all parties, and I think well, that was a no, feature I, of all your stewardship of that office. No, no, I, I'm, I'm not looking for, for credit for all of this. This is just, it's kind of like <laughs> natural behaviour, I think, because we were all Scots and we were all interested and Scotland getting the best deal out of this. So, uh, we, we, uh, these issues weren't in the, our conversations. You know, I mean, when I, when I met Alex Salmon, this is one, wasn't what he talk, wanted to talk to me about. He wanted to talk to me about, you know, um, energy, which he was an expert on, you know, uh, and other things. So they weren't at the forefront of our thinking. Yeah. We'll move on and we will be speaking to Alex Hammond. It's tomorrow he's coming to this yeah. committee, just if anybody's um, looking at our proceedings this afternoon. Adam Kieser. Thank you, Chair. Um, it sounds like that there wasn't always a need or requirement for joint ministerial committees, as you've all alluded to. You knew each other, you had strong relationships. I think it was Baroness Little who said that very often difficulties would be resolved in the tea room. Um, and thank you so much for your time. You've gone into great detail about how joint ministerial committees worked. Um, I'm keen to learn a little bit more about was there an expectation that this would be the be-all and end-all for intergovernment relations, um, or was there an expectation that these mechanisms and structures would evolve over time? 
Baroness Liddell. I maybe start with uh, that one, especially as it's coming from uh, one of my successors in my constituency, and who knows where Coat Dyke is. Um, <laughs> the, the, we, knew, we, we knew that everything would evolve, and we had to get a feel for the kind of areas that were likely to be controversial and the kind of areas where we could come together so uh, the, there was a recognition that we were on a journey because we were right at the beginning and it was that journey and, and having a, a it, we, we couldn't come to final conclusions about the shape that we actually uh, felt, felt we wanted on both sides. But there was a real understanding that it couldn't keep going on like this uh, because people would change, the devolution settlement would bed in and it would probably have to become, especially if there were changes of government in one place or the other, uh, that there may be differences in parties as well. So you had to get something ready for that. But we were, we were feeling the, the way forward at that time. And uh, I think these guys probably had a much bigger job to do than I had, because uh, I occasionally said I was holding the jackets, but actually I didn't really have to hold the jackets because everybody was teasing out, what do we do next and how do we do it better, basically. Douglas, would you like to answer? I broadly agree with the point that Helen's made, and I'm grateful to Des for correcting the record in terms of the 2007 election. That's obviously fallen into a memory hole of post-traumatic stress. But anyway, um, I mean, the, the phrase that's often associated with Donald is it's a process, not an event. The truth is, I think we need to recognise in retrospect, almost 25 years on, quite what a huge event it was. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had worked inordinately hard, generations of politicians, to get to a point where the Scottish Constitutional Convention, in the words of John Smith, represented the settled will of the Scottish people. There had been the hiatus and the political difficulties for Labour, over the commitment, which I think history will be kind to, to embed that Scottish Parliament by means of a, a referendum in September of, of 1997. And in that sense, then that rapidly moved on to the White Paper, the White Paper very broadly reflecting the joint party and cross-party working of the Constitutional Convention, with the singular and very important distinction of, if you like, Donald inverting the balance between mm -hmm. all matters being reserved to Westminster, um, and very clearly giving um, a significant degree of continued and evolving power to the Scottish Parliament to define its powers in perpetuity. Um, and then, frankly, the, the excitement of the first Scottish Parliament elections in 1999, the establishment of what was then the Scottish Executive, now the Scottish Government, um, there was a huge amount of energy and activity that was both reflective of what we knew we wanted to do but anticipating a very different devolved constitutional settlement for Scotland. So in that sense, if the implicit charge is, did you give enough thought to the future, we were almost entirely thinking about the future around those critical years of the establishment of those devolved structures. It is, however, extraordinarily difficult to anticipate what's going to happen at the end of next week in politics, never mind next year or next decade. And in that sense, I think it's absolutely fair to say, did you anticipate quite the character of the, polit of the politics that subsequently evolved? No, of course we haven't. But I think, again, that, that's a very high bar to have expected to have been achieved at that time. Thank you. And um, Lord Brown, with your experiences as Secretary of State, you'd have seen a change of colour in the Scottish Government. Um, how did you feel that there was, was there changes um, that should have been expected with the mechanisms and structures of the GMC? You said that earlier, I think, that you had one that you attended. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think when, when, you, when you talk about the, the, the Joint Ministerial Committee, by this time, this just wasn't a joint ministerial committee of Scotland and the United Kingdom. As it, I mean, the, Wales were involved, and much more complicating Northern Ireland was because there was this post the Good Friday Agreement. So that involved people. I mean, people like Paul Murphy, for example, who is an amazing man in that sort of environment, even if there is conflict, and been able to. You know, um, work with people. So the the the, the joint and the sense of the joint ministerial committee when it met in that uh, you know in that way, uh, you know had 
and really complicated things to deal with. Maybe they weren't so much com complicated as difficult because there were lots of competing interests in this and there were lots of... But there were lots of investments that people had made, you know, like in Peace in Northern Ireland, that had to be protected at all costs because we didn't just own them because we were in government. You know, the people of the whole of Ireland owned it and the people of the whole of the United Kingdom owned it. And the Americans had made a big contribution into that. So it became... It became quite a complicated thing and began to involve, and I mean, I'm not going to read you all of this uh, joint statement from the Ministerial Committee, but I commend it to you to read because it's fascinating to read it, to see the way in which these discussions, you know, became constructive very quickly, but they also became evolutionary very quickly because there were discussions and, and agreements to meet. Uh, regularly, and in particular, they said they, they, they were meeting here in the summer and they were going to meet in the autumn. I was gone by the autumn from this post, so I don't know if they ever did, and I never, I never checked it. But, but then they agreed to meet in subcommittees and in various other ways, and, and the sorts of things probably that developed over many centuries in this parliament started to develop among the, the way the, the, they were working together. So it was an evolutionary process, but it was an evolutionary process that had lots of other factors other than just what Scots saw as being important. That's not to say that Scots didn't have a big investment, and particularly if you live in the west of Scotland, you do have in peace in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, it, the, the, that, it was evolutionary, and, and it was, I mean, um, it was, I'm sure, very helpful to uh, to government um, in all parts of the United Kingdom for a period thereafter, and maybe also in in, in, in Ireland. But you know, I mean, obviously, there times have changed, um, and it's a bit more difficult now. But I don't have any experience about that, and I'd rather not comment on it. No, thank you so much. That was fascinating. It was really interesting to hear about the. Um, different competing interests that would have been there at the GMC meetings and you refer to subcommittees, they then started to fall apart. Why do you think that was? Well, I wasn't there. Would you like well, to reflect upon it? Well, I mean, if you want the truth, I mean, I can give it to you in a pretty straightforward sentence. You know, the politics became more important than the delivery and the personalities changed. I mean, the, the people that we were working with had been around for a while, working with each other and other things. The personalities changed significant. They didn't have the history. They didn't have the trust and confidence in each other. And the politics changed. The politics changed dramatically post the independence referendum. Anybody else like to comment? Thank you. Thank you. Alan Brown. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I'll start with Lord Brown, and at least you'll be comfortable in the knowledge that I won't be adding to any confusion with additional Lord Browns in the, the House of Lords. Time <laughs> um, <laughs> will tell. <laughs> <laughs> you know who Lady Finn is, because it's in your constituency. Um, as you, you actually you, you made it clear, obviously you had a, a joint role in, in terms of Secretary of State for Scotland and Defence. Um, and look, looking back, um, so I've got a rant parliamentary question. So in your, your time when you were Joint Secretary um, with the Scotland Office, there was 54 staff employed in the Scotland Office and the, the salary outgoing is 113,000. Now, by 2022-23, the number of staff had increased by 50% and salaries were over a million pounds. Does that, does that seem a reasonable trajectory for you, given that actually since your time it's actually been two further Scotland Acts and further devolution to, um, to the, the Scottish Parliament. So just wonder if you have any views on that. Well, I mean, you know, I, I, I have read some question and answer about the size of these from the contempt when I, when I was around. I, I mean, if you're going to run a government department that is going to service a cabinet minister, because, I mean, Scotland needs a cabinet minister who uh, ensures that when decisions are being made in Scotland, even if they're not in devolved matters, they're taking into account the interests of the Scottish people. And that, that's kind of like why, if um, anybody was thinking of getting to ask me the questions, why we need a Scottish Secretary of, a Secretary of State for Scotland. But um, that, that's the answer to it. Uh, you, you, you need that. And, 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 and a person who is operating at that level in government needs a significant amount of support because they are collectively responsible for global issues 
as well as decisions being made. So I don't know what the, the point is at which you cross the line, but 54 people or 100 people in the office of a Secretary of State, and I was one, I, I, and I, I was also in the Cabinet as the Chief Secretary to the Treasury and had the Treasury sitting underneath me, um, in a sense, to, to, to support me, and, and, and her Majesty, the HMRC and others. I mean, it doesn't seem to me to be a lot of people if you want Scotland represented properly, properly at that level. That's the best answer I can give to you. I've never been dissatisfied with the people who worked in, the, in the, the, the Scotland office or the Scottish office, never. It's always been a really good team. I've never gone around and counted the heads, but I've not gone in and seen a lot of people sitting around doing nothing. You know, they all seem to be working very hard. And that's yeah, the best. No, I just so, be clear, I wasn't making any cracks. So no, no, I understand I'll, that, but it's, yeah. the only, it's the only answer I can give you, Alan, because I don't think there is a number which is the minimum that you need for a cabinet minister. And then you can add other things. And some of these things that you talk about that have developed increase the complexity. They don't take it away. They increase the complexity. You know, I mean, I, we look at, for example, you know, SEO motions. And all our time, SEO motions just went through. Uh, they just went through. You know, there were 10 or 11 of them. Um, and they were debated in the Scottish Parliament and approved within days of the memorandum appearing. They just went through. Um, but they don't now. They're much more complex and complicated now, and I can understand that. You know, so the people who are involved in this need the staff to be able to support them, but it's not for me to judge that. And I don't think these things are unreasonable. I understand why you're asking. I think they're legitimate questions to ask, and you should ask them of the current Secretary of State for Scotland, not me. I will be following up at some point now. <laughs> Douglas, can I just ask you the same question? I mean, I, I suspect you're not going to contradict Des, but just that kind of paradox, it's increased one of my evolution. Main Yep. Yeah, but increased devolution, but yet the Scotland office, the UK office, has been considerably beefed up and expenditure massively beefed up. As Dave says it's a, it's a very reasonable question, but I think the only reasonable answer is it depends what they do. And in that sense, there may well be greater demands and greater requirements than were the case at one period of time. Subsequently, as a proud and passionate Scot, I want to make sure that Scotland's voice is heard around the Cabinet table, and I want the best possible relationships between the UK Government and the Scottish Government. That may require, at some points in the last 25 years, more staff or less staff. But in that sense, I think, first of all, it depends on, on what they do. And I also think, in harshly political terms, there's no right answer. You're going to be criticised if you've got more staff because people will challenge you on the grounds of expense. And if you don't have enough staff, people are saying you're not taking the relationship seriously. So in that sense, you're kind of damned if you do and damned if you don't. It feels to me the real question is, what are those civil servants doing? How well are they facilitating Scotland's <coughs> interests, both at a UK level and in effective joint working with the Scottish Government? OK, thanks. Ask uh, Baroness Liddell, you, you said earlier on that you did... I mean, a lot of the, spoke about the process and things were... You felt things were always resolved amicably, but equally you also said that you felt the government should have focused better on how devolution would work. So in a way that, that suggests some machinery government didn't understand or some other cabinet ministers didn't understand how devolution would work. So can you explain a bit more of what you thought was a failing of government to properly think through? No, I don't, I don't think it was a failing. I think it was a realisation that we were part of a process because you, you, if you walk into any organisation, even if it's a brand new one, uh, you, you've got to analyse it and find out what works and what doesn't work. Well, I, I know that when uh, George Fawkes and I were in the Scotland office, we had, we had very, very few staff because they had not got to the stage yet of knowing exactly uh, what jobs needed to be covered for, for our point of view. And it was, very, uh, it was a very challenging time because, you know, I had come... I, I had been the energy minister with responsibility for competitiveness in Europe. Uh, I must have had four or five times the number of staff just working in that one portfolio that I had whenever I, I went to the, the Scotland office. So, but it was... Everybody was in a process of of learning how much you needed and what was what were the key things that you had to get right. So it was part of the process of transition. And we knew it was a process of transition because you, you, anybody start setting up a new organisation really has to think quite hard about what it's going to be like in five years' time, 10 years' time, 20 years' time. And nine times out of 10, you won't get it perfectly right. 
Thanks. I was going to ask if, if I'm remembering this right, um, in the aftermath of, of the decision to go into Iraq, the Scottish Parliament held a vote about the merits of Iraq, and obviously foreign policy is a reserved matter. Was there ever tensions arising from the fact that the Scottish Parliament was actually debating and voting and th uh, discussing these matters? Um, that preceded my time in office in the sense that the military action taken in Iraq was in 2003 and I served from 2006 to 2007. So it might be um, better asking uh, that uh, of an earlier period, but certainly my recollection was um, our colleagues um, across the political parties in uh, Holyrood were not shy in offering their view on that or indeed on a range of other issues and those conversations would have happened privately as well as publicly. And in that sense, I think it probably evidences the, the informal dialogue at the time, but, but really it would probably be better directing the questions to, to anyone who was overseeing that particular um, period. Certainly, if there were issues of controversy, and I genuinely can't think what they would have been during my time in office as Secretary of State for Scotland, because as Des said, there was broadly an alignment in terms of policy, then, um, people don't stop being politicians because they're in one parliament or the other. Those political conversations would have continued. Just, uh, Barnes, I know you, would, would you still be in post when that yeah, debate was yeah. happening in I Scottish was, I was still the, the Secretary of State at that time. And, you know, we, we would tell Cabinet um, about the, the, the nature of the debate in Scotland. And uh, as a consequence, Parliament understood, well, our side understood what the nature of the debate was in the Scottish Parliament about Iraq. And of course, it mirrored, it, it mirrored everything that was happening elsewhere in the country. Scotland was not different because there was a debate raging right across the country. And we all knew what that, that debate shaped up to be. There's never any feeling from other minister, UK ministers that the Scottish Parliament shouldn't be debating. What was reserve matters? I don't recall anything like that. Um, yeah, people people recognised that everybody had a view in these things, but I, I don't actually recall uh, anything like that. I look round at George Fowkes. Yeah. I, yeah. I can't remember. Um, Let's remind witnesses that they should be referring to members of the public in regards to how. <laughs> yeah, how I'm very um, sorry, Mr. Chairman. Spying strangers. <laughs> I spy strangers. <laughs> um, can I put another question to Des, please. Des, if I remember when you got appointed to the House of Lords, I remember an article in our local paper, the Command Standard, where you said one of the things you would do if given the chance was vote for abolition of the House of Lords. Is that still your view? And is I think it was the abolition. I think it was reform, I said. Right. But it may um, have been. I, uh, um, I mean, I'm still in favour of reform of the House of Lords, yeah. I mean, it, I mean, should that be looked in the round? I mean, is there a paradox that the House of Lords can actually have a greater say in some legislation that affects Scotland than obviously the, the Scottish Parliament can? I mean, the Scots are quite well represented in the House of Lords, I have to say. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's no shortage of Scots in the House of Lords. What is there? There is a shortage of Scottish nationalists in the House of Lords. But that's your choice. But so the. Um, I mean, you've got to bear in mind that I went into the House of Lords post-2010 when every party, including the two parties that come out in government, went in with a manifesto that said they would reform the House of Lords. Uh, they, they, in my view, the reform of the House of Lords that was proposed by the coalition was badly handled. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, if you want me to put it in caricature terms, it was unlikely that a package that included reducing the size of the House of Commons by 50 seats was going to be welcomed in the House of Commons when we were closing the retirement home, as they saw it. <laughs> um, so, and that's exactly what happened. I thought they tried to do too much together um, and lost the referendum on the, the, um, the, 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 the uh, voting uh, issue. So, I mean, I was in favour of that reform, and I remember saying to the Prime Minister when he asked if I would go into the House of Lords, I said, I will only go into the House of Lords if I can vote for its reform. And I thought I would have an opportunity to do that, but I didn't. And, and I'll not be surprised if all of, in the next election, which will be relatively soon, we don't have another election in which all parties go in to the, the election with some proposal for the reform of the House of Lords. 
We can't abolish the House of Lords because we need a second chamber unless we're going to change the whole structure of the Parliament in a unicameral fashion. We need a second chamber. It's just how we put it together that matters. Um, Douglas, can I ask? Um, so, Anna Sarwar said that if there's a, a Labour government comes in after the general election, if he becomes First Minister of Scotland, obviously, uh, it's anticipating the Holyrood election, then he was talking about return possibly a fresh talent scheme that Labour had before and also additional money coming to the Scottish Parliament to reduce waiting lists. So is that, is that the type of future in that dream scenario from a Labour perspective? Is that the kind of intergovernment relations and working that wants to be seen going forward? to be straying rather far away from the period of 2005 to 2006, or my, I'm getting my dates wrong again, 2006 to 2007 when I was Secretary of State for Scotland. If I learned anything during that tenure, it's that respectfully the idea that a candidate standing in the UK uh, parliamentary elections for the Labour Party should tell the leader of the Scottish Labour Party what his manifesto should be or what his policy should be is probably ill judged. So I think I'll take a pass. <laughs> and I think we'll maybe just leave it there. Thank you ever so much. You, you finished, Alan? You yeah, yeah. Finish? Thanks. Um, Christine Jardin. Thank you very much. Um, can I thank you all for coming today? And it's nice to have a reminder of actually how excited we all were mm. and how important we all thought devolution was at the turn of the century. And from everything you've said, it strikes me there was a different time Lord Brown, you said we were all interested in Scotland getting the best deal out of this. Um, Baroness Ledo, you said that we, we recognised that we were on a journey and that it would evolve. Uh, Mr Alexander, you talked about, you know, you were, we were entirely thinking about the future. Mm. That's a much more optimistic and positive view of devolution and the relationship between Westminster and Holyrood than we experience here on a daily basis. Mm. <laughs> Can you give us any insight into why you think we have lost that? Why it's become so process driven and so much about conflict rather than us working together in the best interests of Scotland? Mm. I would echo the, the point that Des made earlier, which is structures are important, but are always going to be trumped by politics. And the reality is the character of Scottish politics and Scotland's relationship with the United Kingdom politically has changed significantly since all three of us in our different roles served as Secretary of State for Scotland. Um, that's been a consequence of, of the Scottish National Party winning a series of elections. Um, respectfully, I struggle to identify a single area of Scottish public life that has got significantly better in recent years. The Scottish National Party have now been in power for 16 years. Um, that's longer than the iPhone has been invented. So they've been in power for a long time. And in that sense, um, I worry that a politics focused on identity, who we are, not delivery, what we do, has been the currency of Scottish politics for a long time. And so while I fully understand the interest in looking back retrospectively at the structures of intergovernmental relations over the last 25 years. I think if we want to have a more generative, positive, future-oriented politics characterising the relationship between the UK government and the Scottish politics, ultimately it's in our hands and the choices that as Scots and across the UK that we make in democratic elections. Thank you. Can I ask if Baroness Little or Lord Brown would like to add anything? I, I, I very much agree with Douglas in that, and the, the whole tenor of the discussion between Scotland and the UK and vice versa has changed, and it's, there is a negativity around on all sides, and I don't think that's good for, for uh, either Scottish politics or, or British politics. Lord Brown? I, mean, I had an opportunity earlier to share the, the reasons. Maybe I didn't, well, didn't deliver them with the fluency of Douglas or the politics. Uh, um, but, it, uh, I mean, it seems obvious to me that that's why. I mean, that is what has changed. The politics is, is completely different. And, and I do think there is something in the issue that the personalities, you know, were not in this at the beginning, as it were, you know, and, and didn't live through, the, you know, the time when Scotland was de developing into a, a country that, you know, was looking for 
Um, with, with the amount of politics anyway, you know, looking for the opportunities that devolution generated, and I think we lost that. And we did, um, you know, as a matter of fact, lose a lot of people um, in a very short period of time who had this in their DNA. I mean, we're not unique in the sense of many of us. And I came to, I mean, I came to representative politics much later than Helen did, and um, and Douglas was involved in the shaping of. Uh, the government that, that, that brought this devolution about. So um, they can talk about it with more authority than I can, but I'm pretty certain that politics and personalities are the problem, if it is a problem, but rather than anything else. There's also the very fact that uh, the, this relationship between what is reserved and what is devolved uh, keeps being muddled up as well. Uh, we've got to be very careful, particularly as things exist at the moment, where we've got two wars going on, we need to be very, very careful that we don't give our enemies the opportunity to drive us apart. And that is something that, that we adhere to and try very hard not to get ourselves dragged into all of that. But these, these are difficult times. These are extremely difficult times. So it's quite important not to uh, exacerbate the differences between the two on, for example, foreign affairs, because that's one of the key issues that could affect all of our futures. Thank you. Yeah, I just one, uh, sorry, sorry just, just on the point about the wars, there is a there is a particular problem at the moment because there is there is a part of our politics now which wants to take one of these wars and overlay it on our domestic politics, um, which is really damaging in terms of many things I think to this country and and unfortunately in my view to the you know the 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 actual wall I'm talking about I mean I'm, if anybody's in any doubt about what I'm talking about I'm talking about what's happening in Gaza at the moment and as well but there's just a, there's a constant desire in certain places to overlay this on our politics for partisan purposes mm -hmm. and it's terrifying. Mm. Thank you. One one of the um, one of the unusual things about um, both uh, Lord Brown and Mr Alexander's tenure as the Secretary of State for Scotland was that it was a joint mm -hmm. ministerial role that you had. How That was very different from anything we've seen since then. How well do you think that arrangement worked for Scotland specifically and for the office? I think it was a function of its time in the sense that relations were broadly very good. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, the relationships were working, there's external and independent evidence to adduce uh, that that was the case. And in that sense, we were both blessed by having David Cairns as a Minister of State, who did a power of work day in, day out, and was comfortably one of the most able Ministers of State that I had the privilege of working with. And I would echo Des's comments as well. We had very capable civil servants within the Scotland office. So in that sense, I did not feel we were underpowered at the time in the sense that we had a minister who was working flat out and was a very um, engaging and constructive colleague to work with as well as being very capable himself. We had good officials and frankly we had good relationships and aligned objectives and in that sense um, a lot of that changed quite rapidly and so I'm not suggesting that's a prescription. I actually echo exactly the point that um, Helen made earlier about the virtue of having somebody who can speak up for Scotland across a full range of portfolios within the UK cabinet. Um, but on the other hand, I don't look back and think that there were choices or decisions that would have been taken differently if there had been a different structure at the time. Yeah, I mean, I admit, Christine, I, did, I didn't, in preparing for this, go around looking for failures and <laughs> mistakes that were made during my time. Um, but I, I mean, I'll be honest with you, I mean, I, I don't recollect anything that kept me awake at night that emanated from the Scotland office when there were plenty of things that did when I was a Secretary of State for Defence. Um, so, I, I, you know, nothing quite prepares you for having a job that people who work for you, you know, will die on the job as part of their profession, you know. So, um, the, uh, I mean, I, I, I say to you candidly, I mean, if, if people in questions want to point out things that could have been done better if I had you know, only had one job to do, then I, if that's the case, I'll accept it and apologise for it. But I don't, no, I'm not suggesting that. I'm just saying I don't, I can't find anything. I'd, I'd, I'd like to give you an answer that moves with the 
question you asked me, but I can't find anything. Else. What I was thinking more of is the, the speculation uh, that there's been probably over the last 14, 15 years about whether the role of Secretary of State for Scotland was still appropriate um, as devolution has evolved. Mm. Um, and whether there should perhaps be a Minister of State for the the nations and, and regions in the way that the BBC does, for example, or whether it is necessary, as you say, to have that one voice in the Cabinet which is solely responsible for Scotland across a mm. number. And is the Secretary of State the appropriate person to lead an engagement with devolved administration? So, I mean, I, I think that's essential. I mean, I mean, we, we've lived through a lot of changes in government, and they're not always a great idea, you know, because stability and retention of, <clears throat> you know, kind of like historical knowledge is really important. And if you start moving people around, and Secretaries of State sometimes have a have a um, tendency to take people from the department they've just come from and take them with them to other departments. Mm. I've seen that happen, and I don't think it's a great idea. But so, uh, but but there could be something to be said for at the minister of state level having some shared capacity because of for the same reasons the joint ministerial committee was set up to allow that mm -hmm. sort of you know movement at that level, and and there is. I think, I think there's always in these structures, a, 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 it's always a good idea to have a space where people can discuss things which, are not, which is not fully in the glare of the cameras and they can test things together and discuss them and then bring them to, as it were, the summit level, you know. Um, so, I mean, there might be something in that, but overwhelmingly, I think that, you know, that in, in, in our, in our the, the, the way our... our um, country, the United Kingdom, is fashioned, it is important that there's a Secretary of State for, for Northern Ireland. Essential. It's important and essential as a Secretary of State for Scotland. And, you know, you ask, if I ask my Welsh colleagues whether they should have won as well, they'll say it's essential too for the same reasons. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I, it'd be very difficult not to have that seat at the Cabinet table, particularly when you're dealing with international issues and issues that, that flare up, that have impact, say, on our defence forces and so on. It is actually very, very important to have that voice uh, at the Cabinet table. I think having resisted the opportunity to tell an Assar what to do, I will equally resist the opportunity <laughs> of telling Ian Murray that even if Labour does win the coming election, he doesn't have a job. <laughs> I'm not sure that would be well judged on my part. Um, I think the serious point, though, and it references the point that um, Alan made earlier, is there an implicit assumption that if you have high respect and high esteem and strong powers for the Scottish Government, there should be no effective mechanism for engaging with that government in the UK? I just don't believe that's the case. And I don't think that it undermines the validity, the strength, the importance, the centrality to Scottish life of the Scottish Government if you have appropriate structures here at Whitehall, that means that there's effective working relationship. And that's because 25 years on, I still fundamentally am excited by devolution. And I'm a devolutionist. I believe in two parliaments. I believe in two governments. And in that sense, respectfully, there are people around this room and elsewhere who don't have that outlook and who think it's a zero-sum game. You believe in one and not the other. And that's never been my politics. I believe in solidarity, in cooperation, as Des said, and in um, working together. And in that sense, for me, if that's the foundational outlook, which is how do we get the best deal for Scotland by working together, there's a continuing case for making sure that Scotland's voice is heard at the highest levels in the UK and that the UK government works effectively and constructively with the Scottish government. Thank you. Thank you. Just listening to some of your responses to the questions from Chris Stephen, from Alan, do you not think the biggest failure in the, the early years of devolution then was not to set up robust infrastructures that could accommodate the change of personalities and politics? Is that the, the fundamental failure and weakness of those early years, to set in place structures that would be able to take into account the fact that we don't all share the same politics and we may have a different outlook in terms of like agendas and policies? I think it would, it would be very difficult to put that in place right at the very beginning when you don't know how it's all going to start playing out. Um, but the, the development over time 
of, for example, the unhappiness on one side if, if, if one side says something, for example, in relation to, to Turkey and the situation in Gaza, if somebody says something about that, that causes a, a, a problem for the UK government. And how do you balance that? How do you set that right? You probably can't because the, the, the whole issue is around where does responsibility lie and responsibility for international affairs rests with the UK government. So it's very difficult, at, you know, particularly at the beginning of the process, to say, you know, 25 years on, you need a different kind of structure because life, life continues. I can see Mr. Alexander uh, bursting to get in here. I'm just, I'm, I, honestly, I disagree with your question in terms of framing fundamental failures of devolution, because I think it gets to the heart of that balance of structures and politics. I'm actually incredibly proud of the early years of devolution, not simply the fact that we worked together to establish a Scottish Parliament and a Scottish Government, but actually some of the early policy achievements. I think if we were to step outside this room and say what are the greatest failures of devolution 25 years on, it might be falling standards in education, it might be the fact that one in six of us are on health service waiting lists at the moment, it might be the fact that people are wearied by the constant tension and difficulties between the UK Government and the Scottish Government. And respectfully, I think to try and characterise the early years of devolution as marked by fundamental failures, I think of course there's always insights that can be garnered by looking back at history, but I think the most fundamental test of devolution is how does it impact the livelihoods and well-being of the Scottish people. And on that measure, I think during the time that we were Secretaries of State for Scotland, um, we were broadly doing OK, and I wish that I could make the same judgment um, uh, as we look ahead to the years to I come. Think, I don't think anybody's casting any sort of aspersions about what you, what you brought mm -hmm. in terms of you know, like your, your, your own agenda to that. It's just what, what I'm interested in is the structures. That's what we're looking at in this mm -hmm. committee about how they were fit for purpose and going forward. You know, like when, they weren't, when the JMCs weren't meeting, they weren't, the, the governments of the UK weren't getting together. Did, did that <coughs> set off some Precisely, sort of alarm that's bells? That's not true. That, you we know, were like getting point. together. We weren't getting together in the formal structure of the JMC. That's what Helen was describing about the James phone calls in our kitchen. for something like four years during the early period of devolution. Yes, but the point we're trying to make is that at that, point, give, at that point, given the individuals, given the shared history, given the shared ambitions, we didn't need the formal structures that rightly and appropriately were looked at subsequently in different circumstances. But I would struggle to identify now, looking back, what would have been the public policy failures that followed from the absence of those structures during those early years of devolution. And I'd be very interested if, if we could discuss those, because it's certainly from my recollection, it's not obvious what those were. Okay. I, mean, I just think the responsibility to make things work lies with the people, not with the structures. Yeah, that's right. You know, I mean, <laughs> I mean, the responsibility for cars not crashing into each other in the road system is the responsibility of the drivers, you know. The, I, I mean, you, you can make the cars, you know, as, as, as good as you like, and we can get them now that can avoid crashes, but it's principally the responsibility of the drivers, you know. I mean, this shifts the responsibility away from the people who should have it. I mean, my constant experience in life is the best of everything that works is leadership. And it's the people who are leading that matter. The best schools in my constituency are the best head teachers. You know, the best health facilities are the best doctors. All right, so... You can't, I, I just think this is shifting the responsibility. I mean, we're getting very good in politics nowadays at shifting the responsibility away from you know, those people who should be accountable for it. We need to stand up to this. I mean, that's why we get elected. You know, it's our responsibility. Structures are not going to make people like each other and work with each other if, if, if they don't systemically want to do it. And, and whether you like it or not, I mean, that's part of the politics that we're living with at the moment. They don't want to agree. The difference that we are different, we're defining each other by who we are not rather than who we are. Um, and so I, I don't think any amount of changing structures would have made this period of history any different in that regard. But, maybe, but it's a very good question in a sense because it's, you know, it's allowed me to highlight what I think the problem is. I think people need to you know, take responsibility for the decisions they make and make these things work. And then the structures will come. They'll come naturally. Okay. Could I just add one point to Des's point, which is I don't think it's just that people need to know each other and get on, although that clearly helps oil the wheels. It's also do they judge their political advantage is served by accentuating conflict or achieving cooperation? 
And respectfully, in recent years, I think the structure of incentives in Scottish politics has shifted overwhelmingly from what was the experience when the three of us were Secretaries of State. Isn't it a view that if we are going to have a structure across the United Kingdom where governments could approach each other with mutual respect and be able to raise issues honestly and, f and with forthright and with a view about representing the people that they're, they're elected to do that, there should be something in place that allows them to do that efficiently and effectively. And what we have just now certainly isn't the case where there is a sense that there is a, a relationship which is working well between devolved administration and central government. I think we agree on the description of the problem, but perhaps not the prescription. Okay. As in, can you adequately expect structures to compensate and overcome the changed political incentives that we've seen in recent years? Okay. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon to our witnesses. Can I begin by asking, you've all spoken about devolution and, and your journey towards that and what happened in 97 with the referendum and then the election in 99. I want I'd like an answer from each of you, but I'll start with you, Mr Alexander, because you said you're still excited about devolution. It was hard work by generations of politicians. Why then did each of you choose to remain here rather than stand for election to the first Scottish Parliament? In my case, I managed the rare feat of not winning a seat in the greatest Labour landslide in history in May of 1997. When you I got stood in an election. I'm just, I'm just yeah. about to finish my answer. Mm -hmm. I, when I... When I um, continued what's been a theme of my political career of advancing female representation by losing to Rosanna Cunningham. Um, and so in that sense, I was not elected until November 1997. The Holy the election Labour was two Party, years later. Yes, the Scottish Labour Party selections started within two months mm -hmm. of my election. So respectfully, I thought that it would be um, disrespectful both to the constituents who had newly elected me, disrespectful to the local constituency party, and probably not well received from my sister, who was seeking selection next door in the Scottish parliamentary elections. So if your implicit charge is the Alexander it's family it's, disdains no, no, I'm just going to stop you there. No, Mr Alexander, sorry. I'm going to stop you there, actually, because I'm, I'm asking what I think is quite an important question. And it's something that has been raised, and I will be interested to hear from our other two witnesses. But are you saying then, had it not been for these other circumstances, you would have stood for Holyrood and you wanted to serve, but you were denied some way of serving in the Scottish Parliament. And obviously you were not elected here in 2015. Did you consider standing in 2016 or 2021 eh, for Holyrood when you've had opportunities which I would assume eh, have not been conflicted in the same way you've just articulated? Former Labour Prime Minister James Callan's political biography is called Time and Chance. I think it's the perfect description of a political life in the sense that the opportunity arose to be elected to the UK Parliament in November of 1997. I sought to finish the answer, which was to explain that for a combination of personal, political and representational reasons, I did not judge it was appropriate as a brand newly elected member of this parliament to seek selection in the Scottish Parliament, as a number of our colleagues chose to do at the time. Um, I then served in this parliament for 18 years. Um, the people of Paisley um, uh, made a different choice in the general election of May 2015. Uh, they certainly did. And on that basis, um, I think I, I made a choice to pursue other interests, as I sought to describe in my introduction. But, you know, if the opportunity had not come to be elected in November of 1997, I had, along with Lord Fouts, who I'm not allowed to reply, uh, identify, who was the chair of the Labour uh, campaign for the Scottish Parliament. I was the vice chair of the Labour campaign for the Scottish Parliament. I stood in George Square in 1992 protesting against the Conservative government seeking, seeking the establishment of a Scottish Parliament. I carried torches in Carlton Hill looking for a Scottish Parliament. I was a committed devolutionist. And that's if why I me to finish the answer. Well, I've, if the opportunity had not arisen mm -hmm. to seek to serve the people of Paisley, then I think it's perfectly within the bounds of possibility that I've put myself forward for selection. Whether I would have been selected, I don't know, and indeed whether I would have been elected, I don't know. Grateful. Baroness uh, Little. Uh, I actually went to the Prime Minister and asked him where did he want me to stay, and he pointed out, A, that I was an economist, B, that uh, my knowledge of financial services had been honed, honed whilst I was in the Treasury, and uh, he thought the best place for me would be to stay at Westminster because of the responsibilities at Westminster. <coughs> and uh, I pointed out to him that I had a, a daughter still at primary school and a son still at secondary school. And he said, well, they'll grow out of that. So stay where you are. <laughs> or Brown. Yeah, that's a great. Um, it's, it's great when politicians are asked to talk about themselves. Um, so, uh, 
I, I, uh, I mean, I hadn't six weeks before the 97 election any idea I was going to become a Member of Parliament. I mean, Willie McKelvey, who was the MP for Kilmarnock, where I um, had lived most of my adult life and was involved <coughs> in the Labour Party, suffered a stroke six weeks before the election. And anyway, the, the story from there is public. I was, I was a, 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 a Member of Parliament. And the truth is that I made it very clear to everybody, anybody who would listen to me, that I, that I was in it for the long term. I wasn't just going to do a, a, you know, a one parliament. If I could win the elections, I was going to stay for three terms. Uh, and and I, I, I made it public in the party and everybody, I was going to stay for three terms, because honestly, I thought there were people who stayed too long. Um, uh, I mean, it's just, it was my prejudice. Um, so I left in 2010 by design. I mean, there were people in here who told me that I was very stupid, that I would become a lame duck, and, that, and maybe I did. But um, so, and, and, and when I left in 2010, I had no intention of going back into politics uh, because, because by then I was committed to doing what I do beyond the House of Lords um, because I'm, I, I'm very focused on disarmament, you know, as a, as, as a, a, a contributor to peace. And I, I mean, I'm still the only Secretary of State for Defence that has ever spoken at the Committee on Disarmament in Geneva. And I had, by then, connected to an organisation that's all this is all in my register of interest called the Nuclear Threat Initiative, which I, you know, took time off from the House of Lords and worked for. And I was asked to go into the House of Lords, and I've already told you some of that, by by uh, Gordon Brown. And I said I would if I could vote for the reform of it. And he said I couldn't. I didn't get a chance, and you know that. And, and, and honestly, I've stayed there for a number of reasons. One of them is I enjoy it immensely. Second is it is a place where you can work across the aisles. You know, you can, you, and, and, and the committee structure, which I enjoy immensely, is very well serviced by the people in this place and produces excellent reports. And I enjoy the work in the space that I'm interested in. And it makes me, I mean, it makes me more effective in that place because you've no idea you know, when you go to America, how eager people are to meet members of the House of Lords if they offer to meet with them, you know, whether it's, it's got a great collective. So that's the whole story. It just yeah. generated it. I never made it. I mean, I would have gone into the Scottish Parliament if the opportunity had arisen, but the opportunity arose for me to come into this Parliament. I stayed the three years, but I went off and I did the things I wanted to afterwards. There, there was no uh, trick question around that. Mm. It was simply because I, I, it is still something that is spoken about, that mm. perhaps if more big hitters had gone from here <laughs> to Holyrood in 1999, some of the issues that we're looking at may have been resolved uh, from the Holyrood side rather than the Westminster side or, or vice versa. So I think it is interesting to get your individual takes uh, mm. and your individual reasons. You've all served as Secretary of State for Scotland and never used the power, but would be aware of Section 35. What is your view of that being included uh, in the Scotland Act uh, at the time? And were there ever um, points in your time in Dover House where there was even reference to or mention about enacting Section 35? I, mean, I can answer that very quickly. I never paid any attention to Section 35 <laughs> until it was used. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, just, I mean, it was not a part of my thinking about it until it was used, and I, I, I never paid any attention to it. I don't have a sort of relationship with it before then. No, sorry, can I just to make sure we're clear, but by not using it is also a decision. So I'm just checking, you had never in your time no, no, never, in, in the Scotland office, it never, never had a course to, a recourse to consider using it. But I think as one of your previous witnesses um, described it, it was included in the Scotland Act as a safety valve. And in that sense, we didn't have recourse or reason to use it. Baroness Little, you obviously spoke yeah, about this, in, but you obviously spoke about this in uh, the House of Lords. Um, yeah. You, your view as a former Secretary of State about it being used in these circumstances? Too much like days. You know, mm. the uh, it, it was n n nothing that I ever thought about using uh, as a sort of hammer to crack a nut. But it's having now discussed this with the then Scotland Office Minister, and you referenced your time as a, a director, executive director of the Scotland Scottish Prison Service. So you have an interest personally uh, in this policy and the use of Section 35. Was it correct for the current Secretary of State for Scotland to use that? Uh, it's up, entirely up to that Secretary of State. You know, we don't, don't know the briefing that are being received in that. And incidentally, I was a non-executive yeah, director of the Scottish Prison yeah. Service. I don't know that much about prisons. Yeah. You don't, do any of you have a view? I mean, you've spoken about wars and other things that you're keen to speak about. Any view on 
the use of it? I think it's deeply regrettable that um, relations between the Scottish Government and the UK yeah. Government yeah. deteriorated yeah. to a point where instead of the kind of collaboration that characterised our time in office, mm -hmm. we've seen recourse to the courts. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. not at that point. The courts came after. So the initial use of the Section 35, you think... So, so your view is it shouldn't be needed because the relationship should be better before you get there? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that's kind of where I am, you know. But, I mean, I, I, I mean, we all made decisions that people have criticised and, you know, we stand by them and I'm sure people make decisions that they stand by and they weren't all perfect. Um, you know, so, I mean, I'm not going to... I mean, if I was, if I was ending the discussions in the office and saw all the balances back and forward as to what... I mean, I, I would express an opinion, but I'm not just going to kind of, like come in here, you know, at 30,000 feet, look down on it and express an opinion. I mean, there's still a bit of a lawyer in me that I think you should see what the arguments are first, and I'm not... Well, I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, people make these decisions and they, they, they have to stand by them. But it would be much better if we didn't have to resolve these problems in the courts. Uh, and speaking about being a lawyer, that leads into my next area. Uh, how content are you with uh, what was done in ninety seven? Uh, leading up to 1999, courts came after. So the initial use of the Section 35, you think... So, so your view is it sh shouldn't be needed because the relationship should be better before you get there? Yes. Yeah, and that's kind of where I am, you know. But, I mean, I, I, I mean we all made decisions that people have criticised and, you know, we stand by them and I'm sure people make decisions that they stand by and they weren't all perfect. Um, you know, so, I mean, I'm not going to... I mean, if I, was, if I was ending the discussions in the office and saw all the balances back and forward as to what... I mean, I, I would express an opinion, but I'm not just going to kind of, like, come in here, you know, at 30,000 feet, look down on it and express an opinion. I mean, there's still a bit of a lawyer in me that I think you should see what the arguments are first, and I'm not... Well, I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, people make these decisions and they, they, they have to stand by them. But it would be much better if we didn't have to resolve these problems in the courts. Uh, and speaking about being a lawyer, that leads into my next area. Uh, how content are you with uh, what was done in 97, uh, leading up to 1999, uh, and since then about the dual role of the Lord Advocate as Head of the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service uh, and uh, attending Cabinet, uh, an appointee of the, the First Minister? Is, is that the, the right basis to have the most senior law officer in Scotland having that dual role? I don't think it's the right basis to have a senior law officer anywhere, to be honest. I don't, I, you know, I mean, I think if, if the role of the law officer as the chief prosecutor of the country needs to be taken out of politics, I think. You know, I mean, I don't, I don't think there's any doubt about that. I, I mean, it's like every, I mean, occasionally you get people who do this job, you know, I mean, I, I mean, when, when Lord Mackay was, you know, the Lord Advocate and came down here, to the House of Lords, he very quickly moved into the political world because the, the Prime Minister he was serving found him to be what we all know he is, which is one of the great wise men of the world, you know, who was able to give her, I think she said, solutions rather than questions. Um, but I don't think it's healthy for democracy to have that, that connection. Was there any the thought, thought at the time when well, I don't, Scotland Act was going through? Obviously, this was carrying forward that distinction, but... I mean, again, we're looking 25 years in. We've invited former and, and the current Lord Advocates. This is an area that, that we are looking at. Um, there is cross-party support, I believe, in Holyrood to oh. uh, do that. But at no point when, when you were in, in office did you, did you look at that? I, I mean, can, can I just say, I mean, I, I wasn't part of any discussions about this at the time, but when I reflect back on it, I can see that the people who were doing what they were doing, you know, decided it was better to keep this distinctive Scottish... Yeah. position than to start to, you know, I mean, you, you, you take on the institutions of the law and the judges and these things, you know, th this would have complicated the process to a degree that I don't think was necessary. Also, understand. Better to leave these yeah. Scottish officials and the enormous history of the law to advocate, it would be better to be left there. Deal with it later. I understand the contemporary politics, but what we're talking about is intergovernmental relations. Mm -hmm. And back in 1997, it was um, the establishment of the Advocate General that was the legal innovation yeah. to make sure that there was effective Scottish legal advice available, um, given the absence of um, the Lord Advocate and the Solicitor General, who were rightly going to be sitting within um, the province of, of the Scottish uh, executive, then Scottish Government. So in that sense, 
I'm, I'm not sure it would be wise, as former Secretaries of State, to suggest that that was legitimately the province of the UK government mm -hmm. in the subsequent years when we were serving, mm -hmm. when by that time it was legitimately a matter for consideration within the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government as to what's the appropriate structure for Cabinet or I'm prosecuting authorities. I'll be aware as a former Secretary of State for Scotland it would take uh, an Act of Parliament here, whether an SI or otherwise, to uh, take away that dual mandate. So it is very much an issue for you when you're Secretary of State mm -hmm. for Scotland. You could have gone to a, a committee and, and passed that SI or your junior minister. It, it's something that the current Secretary of State for Scotland could do. Uh, and I think this is why this has been raised at our inquiry already. You said you, you listened to the, or you looked at the evidence, uh, Lord Wallace, <coughs> Anchor Ness and others uh, spoke about this. So I think it's absolutely right that this committee at this time in this inquiry, it looks at this issue and there would have been opportunities should you have wished to pursue it. For a second dispute the right of the committee to mm -hmm. raise the question mm -hmm. and ask the issue, I do certainly question whether it would have been right for me as the Secretary of State, contrary to the wishes of the First Minister and the Scottish Government of the time, to seek to introduce legislation at Westminster affecting the operation of the Scottish Prosecution Service and the Scottish Cabinet. By saying that, you know that was the view at the time? They, they didn't support, because you said contrary to their views? Well, they didn't seek to change it. And if they'd come to me and said, listen, we're very keen to establish an independent... <coughs> we're trying service, to get that. There was never any discussions... It, but it was never raised. Never, yeah. uh, throughout your time, never any discussions but, about that. Yeah. I mean, there's a very good reason why this committee should be considering this in this context, because other people are talking about it out there quite a lot. You know, it's a big conversation. Uh, so it would be... I mean, it would be inappropriate for you to ignore it. If, you know, so I'm, I think you should talk about it. It never was that in any of it. And... and uh, you know, and, and it just it was one of, you know, the Lord Advocate's role was a distinctive role and part of Scottishness. And I, I, I just think at the time it would have been a complexity and a, and a controversy that would have been better, that was probably best left for another time, but more importantly, best left for the Parliament that we were creating. Uh, finally, I, I wasn't going to raise this issue. I didn't think it would come up, but you have proactively, um, a number of you mentioned, not yet Mr Alexander, but we'll maybe get his views about reserved and devolved issues, and in particular the, the current conflict in, in Gaza uh, and the situation uh, between um, uh, Israel and Gaza and Hamas. Is the current First Minister wrong uh, with what he has articulated uh, on this issue and funding that has gone from the Scottish Government to uh, support efforts in Gaza? I must admit, as somebody who has been a diplomat, um, I think the discussion uh, with uh, the Prime Minister of Turkey was bizarre and it should <coughs> not have happened and there certainly, if it did happen, there should have been an official from the Foreign Office who was present at the time. There is a war going on. You don't muck about when there's a war going on. Or Brian? Well, I mean, I've avoided uh, getting involved in any of these controversies for the reason that I spoke about. I mean, I... I, I I abhor the, the, the constant overlaying of this onto our politics for uh, other reasons. And there's nothing that I can say that will not be controversial on one side or the other. That doesn't normally avoid me exp expressing my view, but this is particularly sensitive. Um, I mean, he is accountable to other people and not me, and I'm not um, going to... Uh, you know, he has a parliament to be accountable to, and, and, and he, like, can, he can... He, he, can, he, can, he can live with that, you know. I mean, there is, from the number of perspectives that everything, anybody says in this uh, area, there's no right thing to say, and I'm going to duck the question. Alexander. I think most people observing this hearing would want us not to be seen to be um, seeking to establish political advantage when people's lives are so... Um, profoundly in jeopardy. We've got, what, 1.4 million people waking up today in Rafa. That's mm -hmm. um, six times the size of the population on October the 7th. They are um, deeply fearful. They are often hungry. Um, and I think um, I'll resist the opportunity, which in other forums is, is taken, to seek to establish any kind of political advantage, whether I agree with the First Minister or not. I mean, I, I did preface my remarks yeah, by saying true. I didn't plan to raise this. I was no, interested true. that it came proactively yep. from you. Uh, does anyone want to comment on the issue about funding? So this is, you know, Scottish government funding, um, which goes to 
the Scottish Parliament for devolved uh, issues going in international aid to, to Palestine to uh, assist. Obviously, Ms Alexander, you've got a previous portfolio in that area. I have, after one of the previous IDF incursions, I travelled into Gaza. Um, and I think I'm the Secretary of State who's uh, made the largest commitment to the establishment of the Palestinian state of any of my colleagues in the Department for International Development. Um, that emphasises the importance of how all taxpayers' money is spent. And particularly in circumstances of a conflict, you have to be extraordinarily careful in terms of how that money is being deployed. And I would want and hope that um, uh, all actions necessary are being taken to ensure that money is being used effectively and reaching those most in need and isn't um, vulnerable to being misused. And that's incredibly challenging in a conflict zone. Anything to add? Sorry? Anything to add? No. no. And just on it devolved and, and reserved then to move away from the, the international politics to um, you know, um, more local issues. Uh, do you think it's right, as former Secretaries of State for Scotland, three individuals that still have a very keen interest in Scotland, that, for example, in a devolved parliament, uh, we are spending taxpayers' money on a Minister for Independence? Is that how you think, uh, 25 years on from devolution, we should be having portfolios, people in post, and a lot of taxpayers' money going into a Minister dedicated to separating Scotland from the rest of the UK? Not a revelation that I don't believe in independence. <laughs> I don't think that's going to splash the front pages in Scotland tomorrow. I'm um, and that's in, in fairness, but, <laughs> but equally, we, are, we all we are spend looking. the money differently yes, if we had it. Yes. yes. <laughs> I, I do find it quite strange that, that you're keen to insert issues such as a global conflict, which you know we've 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 dealt with, I hope, in a sensitive manner. But but this is an issue which. Um, you know, is raised many times uh, in your part of the palace um, with regard to the spend of taxpayers' money. Um, viewing that, uh, 25 years on since the uh, Scotland Act, or more than 25 years since the Scotland Act and, uh, and the advent of devolution, is, is it right? I think we're seeing from the silence that they're going to be tempted into giving us a view on that. So we'll perhaps... You don't have an end of the palace, so I presume it wasn't directed to me. <laughs> oh. end, of, oh. end of whatever palace you want. <laughs> you, you spent the best part of an hour and a half trying to get people to work cooperatively. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to... Uh, we will uh, have an opportunity to be tempted into an area that yeah. is going to... You know, I'm not, it's not... I'm, I'm just... I'm, I'm, not, I'm avoiding the question, I'm a coward. I'm not. I'll leave it alone. Interesting. OK, thank you. Yeah. OK, thank you. Well, Sally Ann Hart. Thank you, um, Chair, and good afternoon to our panel. Um, so just listening to you this afternoon and looking at your sort of relationships when um, at the start um, and how your existing personal relationships, I would say, were close, genial, Collegiate and other witnesses have said that as well. And Baroness Little, you said that sort of issues would be discussed in the tea room or on a, a Friday night telephone call. Um, clearly, the relationships between um, the UK government and the Scottish government um, uh, uh, are different. So, how how um, would you have expected back then in 1998 to see what you see now with the relationship between the UK government and the Scottish government? So irrespective of whether it's a conservative UK government, the fact is that the SNP have a completely different agenda to both Labour and Conservative. Would you, do you have envisaged then what we see now? Well, given that I was uh, around at that time, I think having respect for each house is very important. Mm -hmm. And uh, there seems to be a lack of respect now developing on both sides about the, the, the constitutional arrangements that have been made. You know, we are, well, we are not elected, but we have been elected. And it is of enormous importance that those who are elected are actually respected on both sides. And you don't get that feeling from the tenor of the kind of debate that there is in Scotland at the moment. And to some extent, you know, I was there long before social media. And I think a lot of it is some of the, the arguments and the fights that take place 
in social media. We, we must be able to respect people even if we don't agree with them. And to be respected and to respect, I think, is one of the key things in a democracy. Agree with that. I think the honest answer is no, of course we didn't predict exactly the character of politics in 2024, in 1997 or 98 or 99 or the periods when we served in office. Um, but I think the relationship can be damaged from both sides when politics um, uh, changes. So um, it's no revelation that I don't believe in um, Scottish nationalism, but nor do I believe in a kind of muscular unionism. As the answer, I, as I said earlier, fundamentally believe in cooperation, um, uh, and I, I've, um, uh, over many years, advocated and argued very strongly for Scotland's place within the United Kingdom. But I think, exactly as Helen suggests, um, I believe the best way forward and the, uh, that offers the greatest likelihood of Scotland prospering and doing well within the United Kingdom and continuing to make a judgment, as evidenced in poll after poll, that our best future is within the United Kingdom, is that approach of mutual respect. And if we see every constitutional issue or every investigation into um, structures of governance as being an opportunity to score political points against their opponents, I worry, which has too often been the position in recent times, um, I worry that whatever structures we devise, they'll uh, be threatened or challenged by the weight of political incentives to find difference rather than find common ground. Thank you. Lord Brown? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, uh, I, I don't think I had this, this sort of experience that we're now having, you know, on the horizon that I was looking at from way back in uh, the last century. Um, but, I mean, I, th I think the, the honest answer to you is that, that, that I mean, this is not the only place that, this, that politics has changed, you know, the way in which it's conducted to the detriment of, uh, you know, the quality of the government. I don't want to start naming personalities, but, you know, there are certain people who have held very high-level posts that we would have been... I mean, 20 years ago, if you'd asked us, would this person ever become the president of this country, they would have said, under no circumstances, you know, and... The person I'm thinking of just shortly before he was elected, people didn't think he would either. But he's not the only, you know, one. I mean, and democracy has produced many autocratic, difficult people. I'm not suggesting that that's what we have, but, you know, we're, we... The politics has changed fundamentally, and it may well be social media, it may well be other things. I just think it's... You know, I, th I think, I, I think that, that there was always a politics there that was just waiting for social media to come so that they could exploit it or something similar. You know, there were people who became significant... There's no question that there were people in Scotland who became significant players in Scottish politics from nowhere because they were willing to do things in social media that other people weren't, wouldn't have thought ever of doing and none of us would do ever. You know, so I don't know. I mean, how do we deal with that, you know? social media. Sorry? You should ban MPs from social media. Well, I don't know you can ban... I mean, it's, it could be, be, be quite difficult to police, you know. But anyway, um, I don't know what the answers are, but I think the answers are that people who think like us, and I look around this room, and I, I don't... I, don't, I mean, I don't think there are, there's an ultra-partisan politician in this room. We just, I think, need to be stronger voices. That's the best tool we have. Just looking at the Kalman Commission, um, which concluded in 2009 that it may also be that insufficient attention was given to the implication of devolution for the wider UK constitution, and Labour's devolution plans didn't factor into the fact that there might be political separation between governments. So was this something that was discussed at the time that there might be so at the time very strong labor force labor in not labor force but labor in scotland was it was a was a you know the landslide in 2007 was it anything that you'd envisaged happening and um with that was that a lack of thought was it discussed was it naivety arrogance what was it or none of those things Mr. Alexander. Well, respectfully, it wasn't a landslide in 2007. Yeah. We lost by one seat. Mm -hmm. So no, um, I it think didn't prefer. feel like a landslide at the time, uh, painful though the loss was. Yeah. Um, but no, I've, I've never really bought 
this argument that that somehow um, uh, so overwhelming was the confidence that Labour in perpetuity would be elected on both sides of the border um, that we didn't need to give consideration or thought to any other possibility. The reality is, as my erstwhile colleague Pat McFadden observed recently, um, there isn't so much a pendulum um, as um, Labour struggling to win on various occasions. If you look at the most recent electoral record in the UK, it is defeat, 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 victory, 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 defeat, 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 defeat. It would be very hard for a political party with that somewhat chequered record of winning elections then to presume perpetual power north or south of the border. And so in that sense, I've never bought the argument. I know that you had Lord Robertson of Port Ellen in front of you and very quickly asked him the question about killing nationalism stone dead, and he said he'd been timing it to see how quickly the question was asked. (laughs) But I've never felt that was an authentic representation of the motivations of um, the overwhelming majority of us, probably including George, for whom the establishment of a Scottish Parliament stood on its own terms. We felt that there was a fundamental democratic, democratic deficit that needed to be addressed. We felt that the offer that was being made to the Scottish people in 1997 was not just to give democratic expression to the settled will of the Scottish people by the establishment of a parliament, but an invitation to be part of a more democratic, more modernised, frankly more habitable United Kingdom, which is why what was happening in Northern Ireland, what was happening in Wales was also part of that broader offer. So in that sense, it's... It's hard now to go back all of those years, but the reality was there was a very ambitious agenda of reform, certainly in Scotland, reflecting the particular character of the Constitutional Convention and the long-standing distinctiveness of Scotland's place within the United Kingdom, as we touched on with law officers, separate education, separate relationship with the church, etc., which has stretched back centuries, and at the same time, a genuine sense of possibility about... uh, modernised, more democratic and changed United Kingdom. And broadly, I would argue that we were successful in that endeavour, both in changing the constitutional architecture um, at the one point at which it's been tested at the ballot box by people choosing to say that they saw their future as Scots within the United Kingdom, and at the same time establishing a new layer of democratic accountability in our governments in this country. I came in here in 1994, following the death of John Smith. And it it may seem very strange to those of you who are members of Parliament now, but we would be voting at 10 o'clock on an English education bill, and we'd be voting till about quarter to 11. Then at quarter to 11, we might start a Scottish education bill, and that would be going on till two or three in the morning because there are structures in Scotland that are different. Our legal system is different. And it's really because of that that the the whole pressure on devolution as a political concept uh, really gained ground. And I can always remember uh, going down to meet colleagues in the north of England or in Wales or in London, and they're saying, well, if you're going to get all of that, why can't we get it? And they didn't realise the extent to which our legislation was different and had to be done at a different time. And if, if we were doing it, if we were starting all over from scratch, then devolution would have started a very long time ago. It was very, very frustrating to have to do two education bills, uh, legal bills, and it, it, you know, it, it embeds in your mind that the systems are completely different and you have to take that into account. So that is, was for me, one of the most powerful cases for devolution. Mm-hmm. The systems were different and should be looked at by people with experience and expertise in those areas. Thank you. And Lord Brown, do you have anything would you like to... Well, I mean, Kenneth Carman's a very wise man, I mean, uh, which is why he was uh, appointed to, to head up that uh, review and commission. Um, I mean, I don't, I, I don't agree with him on on this. I mean, I, I think I think it's quite easy retrospectively when things have happened to say we should have anticipated that that might have happened. Um, I, I think sometimes we ice. You know, the, it, Helen's just helped here because we shouldn't isolate what was happening in Scotland from what was happening throughout the United Kingdom. Um, and. You know, the other challenges that, that we were trying to face, particularly in Northern Ireland, and I mean, 
Wales, I think, was, was to some degree mm -hmm. a reluctant devolution, but they've made the best of it. And we shouldn't just dismiss it, you know. I mean, I mean devolution has done a lot of good things for Scotland, which, um, and, and it's enabled substantially an expression. I mean, Scotland has a different relationship with its land than England have. I mean, England are now coming to um, discussions about that. You know, when I mean, you ask, you know, for example, people who live in leasehold property in London, whether they would rather have the tenure that Scotland has had for centuries. And um, so, I mean, we are different in many ways, and we've, we have in many, in, in many instances taken advantage of devolution and the ability to be able to build on that and not have all of, you know, the decisions made in a UK parliament, which was tending towards uh, making things the same when the difference was... You know, w w was 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 the best way to go. I mean, I I wasn't um, I wasn't in the, in the days that, um, that Helen's talking about. You know, I didn't have very much experience of that. But at the beginning of my political career down here, I had a bit of experience of travelling back to Scotland in the night train. You know, which uh, w w it w was difficult. But I had lobbied down here f um, for things I was interested in, and um, you know, you should go back and look at some law reform miscellaneous provision bill to see the sorts of stuff that, you know, uh, that was being imposed in Scotland, and, in a sense, and, and, and I really mean imposed in Scotland by people who didn't live with it and didn't understand it and they were doing it in bits and pieces. I mean, so I, I, I think, I think uh, we, 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 you know, we... Um, I, I, also, there is a very fundamental point here. I mean, and this may have been a miscalculation rather than getting something... The ambition was that we would have a parliament that probably would never have an absolute majority. You know, with the, and, and the, you know, the, the, the proportionate representation method of uh, election, the way in which it would operate, there was, I mean, there were very many uh, very good politicians with a lot of experience and, you know, all sorts of sophology in their head who were saying this, you know, this probably never will have, will always have to be, you know, it will be persuasion rather than just arithmetic, you know. It won't be a parliament in which the most, the most important, you know, skill is arithmetic. And, you know, I mean, you know, the, the, the Scottish National Party broke that and, uh, I mean, they did it, they worked hard for it, they deserved it, they won the seats, I'm not complaining about it happening, but it was, that was what was in people's mind and quite legitimately was in their minds, it was in a position that they shouldn't have had. Can I just add one quick point to Des's point though, which is that's absolutely true, there was a conscious decision to embrace a plural parliament, but that is not, uh, the motive matters as well, and the argument that this was somehow designed specifically keep to one keep one party yeah. out of power, I genuinely dispute on the basis of at least the conversations I was party to at the time, where often in a way that was deemed electorally disadvantageous to Labour, that at the time was commanding more than 40% of the popular vote and therefore was winning most of the first-past-the-post seats, there was a genuine determination to try and do politics differently, consistent with the recommendations of the Constitutional Convention, and the Liberal Democrats were very keen and determined that that be embraced in terms of the original design of the Parliament. So I know that that's a matter of dispute, but the reality is there were a lot of people, as Des said, who I talked to at the time, who felt that the character of the discussions in the Scottish Parliament would be different if we had a Parliament that was not based on first past the post, and that then has played out in terms of the choices that have subsequently been made. Yeah. So, I mean, very interesting to hear that, and that actually the whole thing about the devolution was <coughs> to celebrate our differences between our um, nations, essentially, Scottish, but also to to. Well, with the difference. I don't think. Um, I, I, I don't, please don't use the word celebrate it, as a response to what we are saying. We weren't. We weren't concentrating on the difference. We were recognising that that we had different histories, and and we had lots of things we were very proud of that we, you know, we wanted to nurture. And it was you know. pragmatic as yeah. well. Pragmatic. Um, so just in hindsight, so rather than strengthen strengthen the union um, by encouraging localism, which essentially is what you were trying to do, devolution gave to the SNP a platform to promote separatism. So, and we've heard from you that um, the IRG structures are not the issue, it's the political differences. So just taking that into account, um, would you do anything differently now, looking back, with those IRG structures that, I mean, you say you look at the, at the way the voting was done for the parliament, 
in that way. Is there anything you would do differently now to foster more collaboration um, with the IRG structures, with the political differences we see? I would come back to politics and not structures. Um, I wouldn't have um, undertaken Brexit. Uh, I wouldn't have watched the misgovernance that we've seen in recent years. Um, and I would have hoped that we could have developed a different character of politics over those years. Mm -hmm. But I think if the implicit question is, should we have designed structures in the establishment of the Scottish Parliament that would be designed to disadvantage one section of Scottish opinion, I don't think that's the right approach and would have been a flawed design principle. Secondly, do you need to accept the will of... of um, democracy. So when parties opposed to your politics win, there is loser's consent and you accept that and you continue to argue your case. Absolutely. But thirdly, um, do I think the United Kingdom or Scotland has been well governed in recent years? No, I genuinely don't believe it has. Do I believe intergovernmental relations between the Scottish Government and the UK Government have been handled optimally in recent years? No, I genuinely don't believe they have. But that comes back to the point that Des made. Um, leadership matters. Politics matters a commitment to goodwill rather than to accentuate conflict matters. And those are not within the gift of structures to deliver. They're within the gift of political parties and securing the consent of the public to deliver. Yeah. Any other comments? No? Um, I mean, as always, he articulates these things much better than I do. I mean, I just, <laughs> I'm just get him to write the next thing I say. <laughs> Thank you. No Thank you. Question. When did you... Thank you very much, Chair and, and panel. Uh, lovely to see, see you today. Um, I just want to touch on the Sewell Convention a little bit. And uh, in its written evidence for this inquiry, the Scottish Government have said that the Sewell Convention was the most significant principle for relations between the governments set out in 1999. Baroness Little, uh, can I ask what, what, what your view on that is? And given that we um, have heard about how the, the position is, is that everything sits for the Scottish Parliament and less reserved. How did you approach the Sewell Convention or uh, the legislative consent motions in those early days? Well, it, you know, I, I had a much easier time than there is now because the, the party in, in power in the United Kingdom was the same as the, the, uh, the leadership of the party in the Scottish Parliament with, with someone like Donald Dewar uh, there. So we were quite comfortable with the Sewell Convention and uh, indeed... Lord Sewell was at that time one of our uh, one of our members, but uh, looking at it now, when there is this sort of atmosphere of antagonism, it, it would be very difficult. I wouldn't like to be trying to deal with it now uh, because of this atmosphere of antagonism. But at that very early stage, you know, you're taking the principles within legislation and enacting them. How did you proactively take that approach? Obviously, it was infor more informal, but. Um, in terms of drafting of legislation from a UK government pers perspective, how did you engage with the Scottish Parliament? Well, we, we engaged with the Scottish Parliament directly, mm -hmm. but I don't en envisage, I can't think of any area where Sewell was um, a problem for us mm -hmm. dealing with the Scottish Government, uh, but partly because we were elected on similar agendas, similar manifestos, we had a similar outlook in life. It would have been much more difficult if there had been part of it that was alien to what we believed in. And, uh, you know, I, I realised that we had a much easier time than, uh, than those who came along subsequently had. Mr Alexander. I think it kind of evidences the point that we were trying to um, describe earlier, which is it's a whole lot easier when you know the people involved. Right. You know, at the time, Lord Sue was literally a member of Donald's team. Mm -hmm. We knew Donald, we knew John, and we knew others. And in that sense, in the, in the plightest sense, um, the, the legislative consent motions, I, I did some research before coming to the committee. I think there were eight legislative consent motions between the 6th of May 2006 and the 28th of June 2007 that I could identify. Not a single one of them was a subject of significant controversy or difficulty. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, that was partly because if you had a quick word, if there was anything that you needed to understand or be clear on, but also you had, if you like, two governments that were pulling in the same direction. Mm -hmm. So there was a policy alignment and then a legal requirement to give policy expression to that within the devolution framework. But in that sense, they were on things like consumer estate agents and redress bill, um, UK borders bills, tribunal court and enforcement bills, statistics and registration services bill. We were not splashing the front pages. 
But on the other hand, it has not become and did not become, certainly during our time in office, a source of controversy and constitutional flashpoint the way they have subsequently. Topics there, such as borders, yep. where, dare I say it, those have become much more uh, contentious in, in recent years. Yep. The other thing there sounds to me is, is a degree of respect and trust that where you're having those conversations and there's acknowledgement that you both understand on both sides whether or not the, the, the legislative consent motion is actually even needed in the first place. Absolutely. I think... Um, Good point. Muscular unionism can be just as damaging to that trust as muscular nationalism, and neither of them have the interests of genuine cooperation and mutual respect, as you describe it, um, uh, at fully at the forefront, as I would like to see. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Lord Brown, you said that they just went through. Could you well, elaborate a little? Well, I mean, I, I mean I, in, anticipating that you know this legislative consent issue would come up, I looked to see what the statistics were during the time that I was the Secretary of State for Defence, and, I, and thanks to the Scottish Parliament's archive, that there are, there are by year, you know, 2007, 2008, presumably that's their parliamentary year, or however, I, I, I don't know why it's 2007, 2008, but it was conveniently helpful for me that it was, um, they, they list the legislative consent memorandum and motions that were, and there were 10, you know, only one of which was withdrawn, and it related to the Football Spectators and Sports Grounds Bill, which mm -hmm. presumably was here. I mean, it's a, as the Scottish Parliament has found out, is a contentious area to be legislating in. Um, and uh, it, it, they all, um, I, I, I didn't bring all this stuff, but I read some of the memorandums uh, that were presented by the Scottish, uh, uh, Scottish Government to the Scottish Parliament, bearing in mind that, uh, you know, that. Um, that I came in uh, after Alex Am became the first minister, so this was a, lead, a le SNP leadership, and these were being drafted. And it's striking the language that is used in them. You know, I mean, I, I mean, it's, the, people are not making co convoluted reasons why reluctantly we will let the UK government legislate in this fashion. The, the, the Scottish government is saying strongly it is better done this way. <laughs> you know, um, which just seems to me to be. The, the best possible the example of the one that was withdrawn is the UK government at that time represented by yourself and, and other, others recognising that actually that legislation was not was impinging well I don't know why it was withdrawn to be honest I have no idea why okay. it was withdrawn I mean it may well have been you know that uh, I, I, well I can I can make things up I mean I have no idea but it could have been you know, the, 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 do that <laughs> but, no no but it, but but it could but it could have been you know for example people looked at this they had a conversation and in the conversation people said well maybe actually we shouldn't do this at all mm. right mm -hmm. you know I mean this might not be a good idea at all so let's not either of us do it I mean I I I just don't know it's just it's just the whole I, I mean I, I you know because I've had no reason. To be reading these legislative consent memorandums from that time until now, um, no doubt they were read by David Cairns. Um, they, uh, I have no reason to look at them, and I, 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 you know, I was very pleased that the tenor of them, the way they were approached. Now, I, I mean, I can't help but observe that you know these these points sometimes are relished by the people when they come up if they give them an opportunity to play the sort of politics that they want, um, and, and therefore they're uh, exaggerated. Or, but, but you're right, you know, when you get into the Brexit area and you're talking about borders, then these things, I, I, I mean, there's a whole new, uh, you know, area that, I've, uh, you know, that we, we, there's no way that you could, we could have expected people in 1997 to anticipate. Um, so... I, 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 I'm not criticising people for, you know, um, I, and, and I get lots of, uh, I get lots of emails from the Law Society of Scotland and Michael Clancy in particular, <laughs> in which he points out where there is a necessity for a legislative consent. And I'm, I'm very grateful to him for doing that, you know, because he does a marvellous job. Legislation um, is a living thing. And yeah, and so, it's yeah, it is a living important. thing and it's becoming more active, but it just, is it's instructive that it, that this covers, you know, dormant bank and building accounts, criminal justice and immigration, criminal justice, uh, climate change, education and skills, energy bill, football spectators. Well, we've dealt with that. Health and social care, housing regeneration, pensions bill, 
Um, and, and even well, statute law repeals. I mean, that, mm -hmm. uh, we can see why that would be easy if you were getting rid of stuff that was no use of any use any longer. But they're, they're not necessarily look at and, and you know that easy. But there was a there seems there seems to have been a, a kind of willingness to be able to say without thinking that, that Scotland was Scottish Parliament was less important <coughs> to be able to say it would be better just to do it that way. Yeah. It sounds yeah. to me that the reason why the legislative <coughs> consent motions just went through is because of the work that was put in in advance. Yeah. Yeah. And I think to, to Mr Alexander's point, the fact that we're obviously in a position where I've got Professor Jim Gallagher here described the recent breach of the Seoul Convention in relation to the UK Internal Market Act and other re legislation as leaving the argument for strengthening the Seoul Convention to be unanswerable is simply because actually we've come, come together and no resolution has been reached and one side has, ha, has continued. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, when, sometimes I think one side's not moving and the other side's quite glad they're not. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Do you want to com come in, Christy? In this yeah, place? it's just it's something that um, I'm not quite sure which, um, who it was said, it, but about um, Lord Sewell, and it was Baroness Little, Lord Sewell practically being part of Donald Dewar's team. Mm -hmm. Is what we're overlooking in this, or are we overlooking in this, that basically what we had for the first two administrations in Scotland, the first two devolved administrations, was a Labour-led gov Labour government and a Labour government. So you had a lot of people who naturally agreed. So you wouldn't have any, you wouldn't expect any contention over the Seoul Convention because you were all part of the same party, you all have the same beliefs, same belief systems, same principles. And we're looking at a situation now where we have a Scottish national party-led government in Holyrood. We haven't looked at the possibility that if we'd had, say, a Labour-led administration at Holyrood and a Conservative government, that, that might not, it might, we might have faced the same difficulties. So are we comparing, should we be taking into account that if you have different parties in power, in the different parliaments, you will naturally have a much less agreeable arrangement. I think you raise a fascinating question. Firstly, with respect to your own party, there were some Lib Dems in there, yes. in, the, yeah. in the government, Both and it's right to recognise that. Um, people of significance. And they were very significant yeah. people like Jim Wallace and others Absolutely. who had a big influence yeah. on, on the character of that government and indeed its output. Um, but the more substantive point is, um, even if you had a Labour government and a Conservative government, um, you would certainly have, let's say, a Labour government in Holyrood, a government that was committed to making devolution work, mm -hmm. as distinct from committed to ending devolution and replacing it with a sovereign separate state. And, uh, and if you like, I'm not therefore convinced that it is the structure of devolution that needs the remedy, um, because if you have parties, even of different political ideologies and characters on different sides of the border, who share an ambition to make the structure of government within the integrity of the United Kingdom work, that's a very different character of conversation than having a party that is perfectly appropriately given its own belief system, committed to making devolution fail and, and delivering an alternative, which is a sovereign state. Which brings us back to Lord Brown's point about it being people who make it work and not well, processes. Yes. I, I mean, Christine, I'm sorry. I, if, if you, I mean, I'm tempted to say that I mean, there's been questions we should should we have anticipated this and created structures that would have made this work right i mean i'm i'm doubtful if that would it, 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 yeah i mean i'm kind of cynically doubtful that that would have been possible but it's kind of the responsibility of the people who find themselves in government to find the structures that make it work not the people who anticipate you know um yeah. mm -hmm. that they might we, they, we we reasonable people who can work together might not actually be in government and reasonably work together and that people who won't be will get into government you know so i mean i don't i, I know you know, people in this room, and I think they're perfectly capable of doing that. I just wish they would do it. What, ha <laughs> you know? what happens if it's a parliament that's saying that? Because look at issues such as Brexit, the Internal Market Act, and even the Gender Reform Act. It was supported by parties, all parties in the Scottish Parliament. It was members of all parties supported, even the GRA. What do you do when it's a parliament that's 
using its powers, which is rejecting a seal convention, which is then not accepted by Westminster. So how, how do you resolve that? I know you could have good relations and people could get on with each other and there could be a respect from both sides, but surely there should be a structure that would resolve that issue in tensions and anticipate that. Mm. I don't or, know how you would design such a structure to do that. Well, I would argue that we did design such a structure. It was called the Scotland Act. And, and, and in that sense... The, the fact Scotland that we Act, have... the Seal Convention is a key feature of the Scotland Act. Now, things yeah. have not yes. been passed in the Scottish Parliament through all, by all yes. parties when it comes to legislation which is designed in Westminster. How do you therefore then resolve that? I mean, you could have conversations, you could have discussions, but, but people are still going to disagree. So do we not therefore need the structures and arrangements where this could be resolved? Again, I think that's where you, you have to disaggregate policy from politics. You can create structures whereby people can disagree on policy and still find alignment. If you have the political interests of the governing parties in both of the parliaments incentivising constant tension and disagreement, my argument would be it's very difficult to design a structure to overcome that. And if... This is a, par this is a parliament, Mr Alexander. This isn't the government. This is a parliament has decided that this is their view, which has not been respected by the other side. So okay. how... If there's no structure or arrangement to resolve that, what do you do? Well, there are structures that were created by the Scotland Act. But they're not already. working just now. That's why we're having this... But, this is why we're having this review 25 years, because we're coming and, and across certain issues... That's why I think there's clearly a respectful not working. disagreement. I'm interested in your view about what you would do to resolve that particular What I tension. would do would be place the responsibility where it rightfully should stand, which is on the shoulders of the politicians within those parliaments. And in that sense, a parliament is more than a building. It is the expression of the not political sure will of those leaders. I'm not sure we're getting I don't know if, if any of you guys have got a... a the suggestion about how we get between that rock and a hard place where a parliament has decided cross-party on a course of action which is at odds with the, the government down here. How, how do you, if there's not a structure and arrangement to resolve that, how do you resolve that? Is there not a legal process going on here? Yeah. You know, I mean, this, this is, this, I mean, so, I mean, I'm not in the position where I can't comment on it because, but, because I'm not going to influence it, but, but there is a legal process going on here. I mean, there is, there is a genuine difference of view as to whether or not this legislation is compatible with other legislation, which we all hope, you know, can survive. Now, I'm not, I, I'm not <coughs> expressing a view on this because one will be expressed by those courts shortly and that will decide it. And, and that's part of it. It's how you conduct yourself. Now, I mean, mm. it, it just seems to me that it might have been better to get the lawyers in before anybody did anything that well, might have been lead to... We need to move on, and I want Michael Shanks to come in. No, but like no, it's, but, but it's, not, it's not all about personal behaviour, surely. No, there should be well, well, institutions, no, no, structures, I'm, I'm, infrastructure in place I'm just saying this that is, helps to accommodate it. And that's, this is it's, an it's, issue there's always going to, going to be, be politics. But this is an issue that's going to be determined within a legal structure that none of us are trying to change because we're dissatisfied with it or we think it is not the right law. Right, so... Um, so we just, it, 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 the parties to this, who are the Scottish Government representing the Scottish Parliament and the UK Government, you know, are, 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 you pr presumably have made arguments before a court of law, and it may go all the way to the Supreme Court, to, de to, deci to decide whether this piece of legislation done in this way is compatible with other legislation. Now, I mean... What solution, then? But you started this piece. But you started this Hold on. Order. There is, is, there is an example in, in Canada for, which uses the Supreme Court to resolve some of the tension between federal and central government. Do we need an institution such as that which could resolve some of the... I mean, what we're trying to do is find solutions because this will happen again in the future. You may well, Pete, get into the situation where, by default, that's where it goes. But, but I'm not suggesting... I'm not suggesting that, that we should make a structure. We don't need mm. to make a structure. We've already got the courts and we can have access to them if we want to, and we have the law. So there's nothing fundamentally wrong about this. We can do this within the context of our, of our democracy and our legal system if we choose to do that. But it just seems to me that we might have anticipated that, that where, we, where we might have got to, and that the people who were involved in the earlier stages could have got the lawyers in 
to see if there was a, a, a different way of doing that, that produced the same solutions that people were looking for, but didn't engage this, this legal battle. That's all. It's all there. We don't need structures to do it. We just need leadership that is willing to go and see if that will work. We don't need structures. I Michael don't think Schicks. so. We've got structures. <laughs> it's not as if... Uh, we, our, 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 Canada's got Supreme Court. We've got a few minutes left. I don't know why Mike time. wants to go. Michael. Okay, on that on that positive uh, note of collegiality, I, I, I want you to. I'm going to ask a couple of questions just about time that's not your time served as Secretary of State, about what you think the future of this might look like. I want to pick up just one thing Christine asked earlier around. Do you think the level at which intergovernmental relationships happen has changed? Do you think it is now devolved governments and the Secretary of State, or have we moved more into the realm of prime ministers having to? convene summits? Um, I think it's a, a very fair question. Um, I think maybe something that the committee might respectfully consider asking the First Minister, as well as Alex Hammond, um, when he's before the committee, is his approach to, to those issues. Because I think one of the questions implicit in the relationship between the Secretary of State for Scotland and the First Minister was my sense that in terms of parity of esteem, the First Minister was often very keen to be seen, reasonably, to have direct contact with the Prime Minister, mm -hmm. rather than simply operational contact with the Secretary of State. And in that sense, that, I think, was probably accentuated post-2007, um, and we've seen that carried on since then. The other point I'd make respectfully is trying to reflect on, on the conversation that we've just had. Um, we also need to be alive to the reality that you have political parties who, in some cases, want to constantly emphasise that whatever devolution delivers, it's not good enough, or the outrageousness of what the Scottish Parliament or Scottish Government is seeking to do, because they see electoral and political advantage in accentuating difference rather than finding common ground. And I think, if you like, the difficulty we're finding in ranging the conversation, maybe because honestly and sincerely the three of us believe that there are certain problems that can be solved by a more collaborative approach, yeah. as distinct from the political interests of certain parties being advantaged by constantly saying, this is not working, it could be done so much better, or the other side are being completely outrageous, we're the last guarantor of common sense and the integrity of the country. And in that sense, I think that helps explain the political argument that we've had. But in terms of the individuals, I think the First Ministers generally have tended to want to be seen to be dealing with the Prime Minister as well as maintaining operational relationships with the Secretaries of State. Because we knew the individuals, that was very manageable. Mm -hmm. Once you're in a position where you've got different parties and often opposing parties in different parliaments, that's where that relationship of First Minister and Prime Minister becomes a whole lot, in some ways, more important, but also a lot more challenging. Yeah, I, I, I don't think whenever the, the devolution settlement was arrived at, I don't think anybody envisaged such huge tension between both parliaments. Uh, and as a consequence, the, the structures weren't put in place to resolve some of these issues. And I realise I had it easy as Secretary of State because I was dealing with my own party. Uh, in the Scottish Parliament and uh, people that I, I respected. Now the nature of the debate is quite vicious and it, it really needs to come into a place of calm so that we can respect the democratic responsibilities of each side. Now, you know, I, I was very lucky. Uh, I was able to respect uh, the, the Scottish Parliament and the people in that Scottish Parliament and understand it. But now when there is such a almost toxic uh, atmosphere around Scottish politics. It really is quite disturbing and we need to try to find a way that takes us out of that and hopefully the report that, that uh, you guys are going to construct will take us some of that way down the route. Yeah. I mean we are going to shortly be living in a very different place I think in terms of governance. I mean there's going to be change. I mean I'm not uh, I mean, I know what I'd like it to be, but I, I'm not complacent about it. And, you know, we're all going to have to f um, fight our corners to get the votes. But whatever comes out is going to be very different. And, and, and one of the things about a, 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 an election like this, I mean, the, the uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the, um, 
the, the, it's one of those elections where the numbers of people who will not be standing again are going to be significant. I mean, this isn't the only one in which this has happened. It happened in 2010 in, in bulk. And, I mean, it's, there's going to be a big change. You know, and people are going to come to this who have lived through this turbulent period in many ways. And hopefully we're going to get a lot of people who are going to say, we don't want that. You know, um, this is going to be, you know, we're either going to go back to what the people who, 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 who um, were, were the authors of this collectively and the people who legislated for it, you know, wanted, or alternatively, we're going to have a different, much more collaborative, much more... Um, a reasonable approach to each other. I'm, I, there's no question in my, my mind. It's certainly, the people I know in Scotland, you know, who are many, you know, um, you know, I just want an end to this type of politics. You know, they want a, they want an end to it. And and and, you know, I just make this observation. You know, the um, the the public response to. Uh, that drama about Horizon, you know, um, by the STV was was so great because there is a systemic corruption in our country, and people who saw this happen realised that this was the breaking point for it, you know. So there are just there are just things. And it's not just the politics. There are things going on in this country which people want to see the end of. You know, we have an incredible amount of economic crime and fraud and corruption, and we need to get rid of it. Um, and, and we have a politics that is not serving as well. And, and hopefully, you know, the fact that so many people are stepping down um, will allow us to have fresh blood in. And that fresh blood, I think, should be encouraged to look at, you know, what can be done from perhaps the period that we were together or whatever, um, and just say, this can be done a different way and start moving to, to doing it a different way. Otherwise, I mean, going around telling people they should change is not going to help, but new, fresh blood like yourself in the par in, in a parliament is going to help. And of course, the horizon uh, question is a very alive one because actually in, in this place, we've had a number of discussions about how that legislation could, could work yeah. across the whole of the UK. Yeah. And it isn't working, those processes, in the way that we, we might have had in a different time. I just want to ask you um, about whether the maturity of the Scottish Parliament in this, the, the 25th year of it, has anything to do with these differences other than just the politics of it. So if I, I grew up with the Scottish Parliament, I was still at primary school when it was created. It's, it's changed, it's matured, and the people in it have changed as well. So we've got a generation of politicians now who... Yeah. have only ever been in the Scottish Parliament. Do you think that changes the relationship at all? Does that make intergovernmental relationships more difficult or not? And I suppose if we got back to a situation where there was the same party in power in both places, or at least aligned parties in power in both places, would that still create challenge because those relationships you talked about aren't there so much? Mm -hmm. I, I What's also happened at the same time is that there has been a greater toxicity around the political debate. And until we start to respect people for the very fact that they have been elected, then it's going to be pretty poisonous. And that's the bit that has been lost, to some extent because of social media, but to some extent because people think, you know, they look at other countries where people are calling names at one another. That, that fundamental respect has been damaged. And, you know, in the House of Commons, there always was that respect for officers. OK, you may have a go at them, but there always was the respect for those who had been elected. I'm not 100% certain that is still the case. So it, it, uh, the whole tenor of our political debate needs to change, and we need to rediscover respect for the electoral process. Yeah. I mean, I, I think an institutional memory is important, you know, and I think if we have people, if we have people of, of, of great experience in the Parliament, the Scottish Parliament now, um, and I, I mean, I'm not, I'm in favour of fresh blood, but I'm not in favour of clearing everybody out, because I think institutional memory is important. So I think the fact that you, ha you know, we have the possibility, you know, of, of um, and both parliaments, I presume, you know, of new people coming in while holding on to the people who've been there for a long time and understand how it works and have those relationships. I mean, that is astonishing, really, that, 
in the corridors of parliaments, you see people talking to each other respectfully and, mm -hmm. um, and valuing each other despite their great differences of politics. You know, we just need to do a wee bit more of that up front. I would say, um, I think if we've learned anything in the last few years, it's the fragility of democracy, not just in terms of international <coughs> relations in Scotland, but globally. Democracy is not just a way of voting, it's a way of thinking, and it relies on losers' consent, on civility, on goodwill, and a sense of shared endeavour. And in that sense, I see that respectful of the fact that all of you are elected politicians, and it's really hard. Mm -hmm. And the disdain that is felt towards politicians by a lot of people in the public mm -hmm. is actually actively damaging and inhibiting mm -hmm. to other people choosing to enter public life. And part of the reason that I bridled at the suggestion that there were so-called big beasts who should have gone back to Holyrood in 1999 is not just because I'm five foot six, but because the idea that there is only a limited number of talent, there's 10 or 12 people kicking around the corridors of Westminster, <coughs> that without them, the Scottish Parliament was somehow denuded of talent, I've just never believed. We meet people in all of our working lives all across Scotland who would grace that parliament with great ability and great expertise, but too few of them are choosing to go into public life right now. And respectfully, my hope for the report will be that it can make its contribution towards finding a way back to a politics where there's still going to be the strum and drang and clash of ideas. People are going to be very passionate and have strongly held opinions, but there will be a mutual respect and recognition that informs not just the relationship between the two governments and the two parliaments, but actually amongst the individuals within those parliaments as well, and between the public and those individuals, because choosing to put yourself forward for public life is not an easy choice. Thank you. Yeah, it was just a, a kind of final point. Obviously, you all served at senior levels within uh, a Labour government, and it was the Labour government that took forward the, the Scotland Act. In reflection, what, if anything, did you get wrong with that legislation? Or if you don't want to say wrong, what could have been improved 25 years on for what was passed in, in 1997 and the establishment of the Scottish Parliament? Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's something to, to reflect on yeah, feedback in feedback in again. Yeah. We, we did ask other other witnesses, uh, and it may be things the way the Parliament currently runs. I mean, Lord Brown mentioned a, a revising chamber in terms of this place. There are criticisms mm. of mm. of the committee system mm. uh, at Holyrood. I think that's something we want to look at. So it may be just in reflections. You know, quarter of a century on, there's a lot of good aspects of the Scotland Act, but what could have been different then, or could be different now, uh, that would improve our politics uh, and our parliaments? If you, Alan. Um, Thanks, Chair. Douglas, we'll just go back to yourself. So, I, mean, I think many is talking about respecting devolution and about working together, but I'm just thinking if you look at the look at Wales, where La Labour is obviously in power in the Wales, Welsh Assembly, now quite clearly they're very vocal about what they see as budget cuts and budget pressure, and that being the fault of the UK government. Mm -hmm. Whereas we look at the Scottish Parliament, we don't see La Labour in that kind of political sphere talking about the same budget <coughs> pressures. And also, in terms of, I mean, you, you said you think there's been some failures in terms of policy, and that's clearly, in your view, the, the current SNP government. But nobody ever talks up aspects of devolution in terms of the like, Scottish Child Payment, which has left 90,000 children out, out of poverty. So in that kind of respect agenda, would it not be better to talk also up good policies that have been implemented by the party of other government? Mm. I think, of course, you look to identify policies that people support. I supported the, the um, uh, child payment um, that you describe. I regret the fact that it took, what, 13, 14 years to get a genuinely redistributive measure out of what's the very wide powers of the Scottish Parliament. Um, but on the other hand, I think it's the very stuff of politics as to the Scottish Parliament clearly has extensive tax varying powers at the moment. Um, I think Anna Sarwar quoted recently said, and this might help answer the question of Douglas's, I'm not sure this is an intergovernmental issue, but I do think that um, the balance of the interests of the Scottish Parliament has been more social than economic in recent years. Mm -hmm. And I did not anticipate that back in 1999 when the powers were created. And if we're serious about delivering a socially just, more equitable, um, uh, more dynamic Scotland, I would hope that in the next chapter of devolution, 
there is a much greater focus on the productive side of the economy as well as the distributional choices that follow from that. And I think it would be a matter of great regret if 25 years from now it was still perceived as being more of a social policy rather than an economic policy parliament. And in that sense, I think, um, of course, there are challenges in terms of budgets that always are, but there's also a fundamental challenge in terms of growth. And any choices that you face as a government or as a parliament are a whole lot harder when the trend rate of growth of the economy is around 1%, not the 2% as it was during the period that we were in office. Yeah, so in yeah. that sense, there's always going to be distributional questions. But I think in terms of how do you actually answer that, it's not ultimately by taxing more, but by growing more. So in that greater focus on the economy, that would lead to clearly a greater devolution of powers to give the Scottish Parliament more levers of power in terms of economic decisions. I've been having a version of this conversation for 25 years. I'm more interested in what the Parliament can do than a culture of grievance that always asserts what the Parliament can't do. And there are extensive economic powers there. If you look at something like Scottish Enterprise, respectfully, there's a whole lot that could be done with Scottish Enterprise to grow the Scottish economy. I'd be very happy to continue the conversation, but I sense that time is against us. Just, just one last question. I mean, we are going to have a new government in the new year. We don't know what colour that's going to be, but like if current predictions are to be believed, it does look like it's going to be a new Labour government. What would your advice be to a future government coming in like what i'm thinking of things like i don't know the internal market act would you advise them a bit to review that to look at some of the brexit legislation would would you suggest that would be a place that they might want to look at improve the respect agenda perhaps dismiss muscular unionism is that what you would suggest an incoming new uk government and i know you want to talk about the scottish government but i'm interested to hear what you would offer advice to a new uk government on some of these issues well, I, th I think if, if we're going to go down that path, we'll be here another couple of hours. <laughs> um, because there, you know, there, there are so many issues so contained many. in that. But one of the, the key things, and, and you know, Alan was, was talking about, you know, talk up what the Scottish uh, Parliament can do. Maybe the Scottish Parliament talking up some of what the UK Parliament can do, like the Barnet formula. I'm very, very old, so I can remember the Barnet formula being introduced in the 1970s. And the Barnet formula does make it much easier uh, to, to spend money in Scotland in a way that, that benefits people. We need to have more partnership. And it's not about specific pieces of legislation. That is part of the, the overall picture, but there needs to be respect between each elected organisation, because without that, we're going to be picked off and we're not going to make the headway that we need to make. And have you any thoughts, Lord Brown, about what well, you, I, advice I you would offer? I actually want answer Douglas's question, specifically about the committees of the Scottish Parliament, because I think, I think the, the, the committees of the Scottish Parliament are currently operating differently yeah. than, uh, than the plan. There, there is no question, um, and, uh, and and it's not just a <coughs> excuse me. It's just not, not just a numbers thing. You know, it's not just because I was hoping to get some advice of future well, UK well, government. Well, and well I, I, I didn't answer Douglas's question. Let me answer this question first, and then I'll, I'll, I'll deal with, you, with with the question that you've asked. I mean, the, 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 there perhaps is a tweak that could be made to make them, but I don't think it is, and I don't just want to go back and sort of. Um, you, you know, use the, the response I've been using all the time because it depends on the people and the politics, but, but it does to some degree. But if there is an honesty that this, that in the Parliament, that this committee, that these committees looking back on what, how previous committees operate is not satisfactory, then from my point of view, the people who should be looking to change that are the people who are in the parliament and live with it rather than me who observes it from outside and reads what commentators have to say. But I would be very receptive here as a UK um, parliamentarian if there was a conversation <coughs> between the respective parliaments about how we can get back to, in the, in the sort of circumstances where we have the arithmetic we have, to something that works in the way in which the people who put it together wanted it to, because it is, in my view, to the detriment of the parliament that it doesn't. So. So, uh, as far as, as the United Kingdom is concerned, um, you know, we'll, we will, I think, we will govern, and we will govern comfortably in the knowledge that no parliament, uh, um, no parliament uh, 
can prevent a future parliament from changing law. And there is no question that there is legislation that has been passed in this parliament that if we get into government, we will repeal. Um, so, we're, you know, we're, and we, I mean, it's freely known what that is. I can, you can get a list if you want. We, we will change things and we will not be afraid to change things. I don't one, think one of the, one the, of the major, <coughs> major proposals, of course, is reform of your chamber, the, the House of Lords, which is to make it a, yeah. an assembly of the nations and the regions of the UK. I mean, we don't know whether that's going to be pursued in mm. the first term of the Labour government. I just wonder if you, what your views are about that. I mean, that's sort of see Scotland on a par with the other nations of the UK. Is that what's envisaged with that plan, in your view? Yeah, I mean, personally, I would have been happy to vote for the reforms of the House of Lords that were proposed by the coalition government, the specific reforms. I thought there was a lot of merit in, the, in what they put forward, but I didn't get a chance to. I remember those days when I think it was eight different options we had when there was all the... Well, there was one that was Hillary agreed upon. was in charge of... Yeah. But there was one that was agreed upon, and I, I mean, I would, have been, I would have been comfortable with it. Have I mean, you got any advice? That's not to say that everybody in the Labour Party would Future UK government should dispense, Mr Alexander, dispense of the muscular union as a term. I remember the you were describing, and as I recollect, I voted for every one of the democratic options from 2040, 60, or whatever the numbers <laughs> were. So, I, fundamental, I'm... I'm I'm not often characterised as a Benite, but I believe in democracy. Uh, that may make me less popular with some of my colleagues, but uh, yes, at a fundamental level, I believe in it's right that you're able to throw out the people that elect you. And having lived that experience mm -hmm. myself, I say that with some feeling. Um, I'm going to resist it. the opportunity to write the next Labour manifesto. Um, I, don't, I think having avoided losing my job at least twice in this session so far, I'm not yeah. going <laughs> to try and trip and fall into that particular hole. Very disappointed. Well, thank you all ever so much. I knew this would be a robust but entertaining session. I think we've had very good conversations, and thank you for that. I mean, I think there's a couple of things we'd ask you to come back to and maybe help out in terms of this inquiry. If you could do that, that would be very grateful. Any other thoughts that you had, of course, were always open to suggestions, any further views about 25 years of devolution. But for this afternoon, thank you very much for attending the Scottish Affairs Committee. Order, order.